Good evening. Um, looks like it's six o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting, uh, the Manitou Springs City Council to order. It's uh, July the 27th and it's a work session meeting. And tonight we're gonna, t we have one discussion item and that's to talk about the, uh, it's our continuing uh, saga of the, of doing the uh, zoning code rewrite. So with that, I would uh, ask that uh, the city clerk please ca call the roll. Virginia, I can do it. Okay, we're just, we'll try and do, this is, this is Manitou, it's a work session, life should be simple. Uh, let's see, Councilman Bremner. Here. Councilor Wolf. Mayor Pro Tim Fortune. Present. Uh, Councilman Shada. Here. Uh, Councilwoman Johnson. Here. And, uh, Councilwoman Chandler. Present. And the mayor is also present. Great, thank you. Well, with that, um, I think we'll, in just a second here, we, we'll like, give the, uh, the floor to our city planner, uh, Christine. But uh, first, I'd like uh, Alan uh, Delwich, the chair of the planning commission, to give us a little bit of a, I guess call it a pep talk or a little bit of uh, an idea of what he thinks we ought to try and accomplish tonight. So, Alan. Is that good? Okay. Um, I've been thinking a lot about our zoning code and what it's meant to me over the decades and all the fun we've had with it. And I kind of look at the zoning code like a user man manual for land use. It, it defines our um, how we can use our land, the limits, and the, the responsibilities uh, when we use our land. And it, develop, it devi defines things like maximum heights, maximum, minimum setbacks, parking requirements, um, other obligations. Like if you, if you happen to live on a steep slope, you have to do some kind of geohazard investigation, possibly mitigation. These are all, you know, limits rights and responsibilities. And over the years, what we've learned, like we've actually done a lot of tweaking, adjusting, modifying of our zoning code in the last two decades. I can remember at least four times that we've had a, some sort of a minor or medium code rewrite, including a fairly hefty thing a couple years ago called planning for hazards, when we incorporated throughout the zoning code um, awareness of requirements for things like geohazards, fire, and flood. So anyway, what I've learned over the years is whether we relax the standards or tighten them up, there will always be a desire to push the limits, exceed the limits, minimize requirements. You know, like, oh, do I really have to have parking? I don't really think I'll have people, you know, on and on and on. So over the years, we I went back and looked at the agendas that are in the city website document center over since 2003, and we've had over like 550 various items over that time. I think something like 130 conditional use requests. We've had 85 parking variance requests. 150 variance requests so for setback or um, height variances. So it goes on and on. And I guess we, what I, the message I have is that we'd be naive to think that we can do anything to make it so people aren't going to ask to push the limits. It's going to happen. It's just human nature. And we should just do our best to craft the best thing that we can. And I think tonight we're going to talk about some interesting subjects. Great, thank you very much, Alan. Um, Denise? This happens pretty much every, every meeting. Seems to happen to me, so I'm not supposed to talk, right? No, I just want to remind everybody, we probably need to do um, a roll call for the, for the commissioners. And then I need to remind everybody, when you speak, please turn this on and you're sharing microphones and you've got to speak into it and close or otherwise the live stream won't pick it up and people from home cannot hear us. So I'm going to be reminding you when you're, if you're not next to it, I'm going to stop you and say, please turn it on so that we can ensure that everybody can hear it and that it's recorded accordingly. Okay, thank you. Good point, thank you. 
And I'm sorry, I was remiss in not uh, welcoming the planning commission members here tonight. So welcome, thank you. We really appreciate your coming to, to work with council on sort of hammering through this is a, it's a big chunk of work. And uh, I guess it's the, prover the proverbial elephant, we have to eat it uh, one, one bite at a time. So with that, Alan, would you like to take the roll? I turn it on again. Okay, uh, Casey, Commissioner Casey? Present. Commissioner Armstrong? Here. Commissioner Robo? Present. Uh, Commissioner Simmons? Present. Commissioner Reagan? Present. Commissioner Storm? Present. Great, thank you. And then we have uh, some other individuals here. We have, I believe, Logan Simpson representative. So, Christine, if you would uh, introduce yourself, and then we could ask them to introduce themselves. Great, thank you. Um, so, my name is Christine Lowenberg. I'm planning director for the city of Manitou Springs. So, tonight, um, our agenda is, it may look lengthy. It's very interesting. Um, we hope that it isn't painful or full of garbly goop, as Councilor Shada commented last time about getting through some of the zoning terminology. So we hope to really um, bring everyone to a common place of understanding. Um, I'll turn over in just a moment to Jennifer um, and allow her to introduce her team and really get us started. One of the items that um, has come up in recent weeks and we've been grappling with how to address has to do with public input during these meetings. These are work sessions, typically during work sessions, as you all know, um, there's not a formal mechanism for public input, but between both bodies represented here and staff, we feel that it's critical. So what we are proposing to do uh, for those who are in attendance um, is at approximately seven o'clock, we would allow, and hopefully it's approximately a good point in the presentation when we could break for a moment if there's one, anyone in the audience who is present here in the building who has comments or questions they'd like to share. We've set up the podium for them. They can come forward, take, you know, very similar to city council, take two to three minutes to state and more if it's something of, of great interest to the topic that's being presented. Um, state their question, state their concern, allow us to have an opportunity to engage with them. Um, and then later on in the meeting, if there's an opportunity or this group feels it's appropriate, then we would do that as well. If there are any other questions or comments or thoughts based on eyebrows, there's a question. Councilor Wolf. Has the public been notified that they're allowed to give input this evening since it's not usually allowed? No, this was the first time and we've been trying to come up with a process. And so for folks who are here tonight, we would obviously allow it. And then in our upcoming agendas for joint sessions, we would be sure to state that. Is there a way we could notify the public through the Alex and the newspaper and everything so that folks know that our next joint work session, they're allowed to provide input? Absolutely. Thanks. And we chose approximately seven o'clock so that it's tied in with, with this group, but then take a break at approximately 7.15 um, and continue onward. So, so with that, um, I'll turn this over to Jennifer and Jennifer will introduce the team and really get us started. All right, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Jennifer Gardner with Logan Simpson, a senior planner and project manager on, on this code update project. And I have with me Mark White and Reese Wilson, both from White and Smith. Um, they are, the, um, are part of our team. So they're sub consultants of Logan Simpson, but a, a huge part of the team. We're really teaming up on this one for the writing portion. Um, and I thought I would have them out this evening to because we have a very robust conversation and they have a lot of great um, experience to add to the conversation as well. Um, and we wanted to get them on the ground in Manitou Springs. They're from uh, Missouri and Texas. So we wanted to get them on the ground so they could really get a sense for Manitou as we're writing this code because I think that's a very important um, component of, of this code update, as of any code update. But you really need to get a, a feeling and a sense for the community and the geography and everything. So um, so they'll they'll be chiming in as, as uh, needed. and. Um, 
And Mark and I never have any um, lack of words, so we'll try to keep, keep ourselves short so we can really hear what you all have to say. Uh, with that, let's get started. So we have a few presentation slides, and the way that we're going to run this evening, we are not going to do any mentee polling. I want to really have conversation. I know. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> um, <laughs> So we're not going to do any mentee polling this evening, but we are going to have conversations. So I'm going to run through a few slides that give some background and some information and then open for discussion. And we're going to do that throughout the whole, um, the whole evening. So um, we'll be talking about, um, is, is that first piece that you already that talked about? Piece. Okay. Um, we're, we'll be talking about the zone district conversation that we started last time. Um, and then we'll do, do a, con a little discussion and conversation on that. Um, I'd like to get through some specific use regulations as well um, and get through some information and we can have some conversation on that. That'll probably be a great point. We'll probably run up to about seven at that point. That'd be a good little break point. Um, we'd like to dive into some definitions. Um, that was definitely something at the top of the list of um, priorities. Um, some sustainability initiatives and then we'll close it up like we usually do with um, what's coming next. So just a reminder, um, the reason there's things in different colors and different styles is to show our progress. So um, we, the crossed outline is the uh, design standards that we talked about last time. Um, the two in black clarify zone districts and clarify urban renewal area standards is what we started to talk about last time that we'd like to just finish up this time. Um, the items in red were the, um, the topics that were slated for tonight with the use definitions um, specific use standards and incorporating sustainability. Um, and then the last parking and natural and ge geologic hazards will be our, our next um, work session. Um, the three that are in gray, we've already reformatted the code. So we've, we've reformatted it per the um, assessment. Um, and then signs and nonconformities aren't really um, a topic that really comes to a joint work session. It's more just back end um, technical writing. So you will see that when the writing is complete, but um, we, we didn't plan for a, a specific work session to talk through any of those. So those gray items are, are items that will just be rolled into the code that will come to you all. So zoning. I know last time we left off on, on zone districts and I, um, I just wanted to present the zone, your current zoning map again um, to, to walk through the way the zone districts are laid out. So, um, as you can see, there are several zone districts from um, high density residential, general residential, low density residential, hillside low density residential, downtown, commercial, the redevelopment overlay, over open space, parks, parks or uh, public facilities, um, and that's the main zone district. So as you can see in red, those are all your currently current land that is um, zoned commercial. Uh, most of what we're talking about tonight is in that commercially zoned area, um, talking the east end, west end, um, the URA specifically, as we kind of talked about last time, and then those different character areas from the uh, comprehensive plan. So we can come back to this map as many times as we need to for conversation, uh, but just wanted to lay the foundation. Um, the recommendations in our assessment report for this portion of, of the um, process were to assess the need for additional commercial zones as a result of the design guidelines outreach. And we did talk about that last time with the idea of potential new zones for the east end and west end. <coughs> um, assess a need for additional zone districts to address, address the two future land use categories listed up, up on the screen and then potentially reclassify the redevelopment overlay as a zone district. So these were, these were the concepts that we had um, brought forth in the assessment report and that's why we're discussing them today. Um, I just wanted to bring forward a little of your existing code. So in the uh, commercial zone district, there is uh, language to what, what the characteristics of a commercial area might be. Um, general description of uses. There's also a full use table that talks about the different um, uses in different um, zone districts. And then um, talking about uh, where, where they should be located. So 
the zone map, as we saw earlier, is the most, most of the property is already zoned into these categories, but this is at the front end of the code, the description of what, should, what a commercial area should, be, um, should encompass. And um, I just wanted to re remind everybody in, in the last meeting we had talked about a recommendation of um, those two areas, the east end and the west end, um, creating, for those of you who were not here, we had a um, conversation of kind of the east, east Manitou Avenue and West Manitou Avenue and Becker's Lane and the URA area discussing the different um, characteristics of those areas and how to develop design guidelines for each of those specific areas. Um, at the end of the conversation, we talked about do they need specific standards, um, uh, different standards that would be specific to each of those areas, and the answer was yes. So that's kind of kicking us into this conversation of should they be zoned differently or should there be overlays? So I'll go into that a little bit more, but I wanted to kind of lay that foundation that that's really the question we want to answer tonight is should we have just the general commercial for all of those areas with overlay districts that define those different standards, or should they be specifically zoned different? So rather than just being commercial, general commercial, there might be an East End commercial or East End Manitou Avenue zone district, and there might be a West End Manitou Avenue zone district and a URA zone district. So that's what we're trying to figure out tonight is what the preference would be with, with those. <coughs> And again, I, I know I'm throwing a lot of information out there um, here right off the bat, but these were those four areas that were identified in the future land use map. So this map is the future land use map from the comprehensive plan that the, the zoning map should reflect um, pretty much the same general characteristics as the future land use map. So there were these two areas, destination tourism and neighborhood commercial that we talked a little bit about last time that are, are slightly different. There's some different uses, and I'm gonna just flip to the next page here because what makes these areas different are their uses. Some of them have different setback requirements, um, different amenities and different building heights. Um, these are the, the setbacks and um, lot size requirements in your current code for that general commercial zone. So, um, you know, looking at those those specific areas, do they do they fit in the general commercial uh, zone district? And a couple of them, I believe, are actually zoned. We have to go back to the zoning map. Um, this area is zoned commercial, and this area is zoned commercial, and so is this. But this area is actually zoned. I'm going to show you up here. It's just zoned in that um, hillside low density residential, but it's called out on the plan as. Um, destination tourism, I believe that's Cave of the Winds, right? So the, that begs the question, should it just be in the zone districts it's in, or does that parcel need to be zoned commercial to uh, allow for the use and setbacks and everything that they, uh, that they need? So, um, so that's one of the questions. And maybe we'll stop there and kind of discuss a little, and then we'll get into the URA. Um, the URA, well, I'm, I'm gonna move forward on the URA actually. So the URA, this was what was confusing last time to everybody. There was that other map from the, from the comprehensive plan that I think confused the boundaries a little bit. But um, this hatched area that's called redevelopment overlay is an overlay district over the commercial zone for that URA area. And the biggest difference I'm gonna show you right now the commercial zone district versus the redevelopment overlay, they have the same minimum lot size, same residential density, same minimum front lot frontage. So you can see they're, they're the same dimensional requirements across the board until we get to temporary side yard setback and temporary rear yard setback. So those aren't huge you know, deciding factors or differentiators between those two. Um, and then the rest of the language in the overlay is speaking more about incentives um, for developing in that area. So to the point of what we talked about last time um, about creating character in that area, different, different defining features in each of these areas, um, the overlay could be added to, tweaked, refined to d establish that character. 
as a developer, you come in and you know you have, you're in the commercial zone district, but you're also in that overlay. So you would just need to know to meet the general commercial standards and the overlay standards. So that's where this conversation comes in, is for all of these different areas, East End, West End, Beckers, and URA, do we want to have overlays for each of those that have those defining standards that's above and beyond the general commercial standards? Or do we want to define them as their own zone district, simplifying that a little bit, and creating, putting all those standards directly in that zone district? And this can apply to setbacks, building heights, character, lot coverage, can even apply to landscaping, parking. All, all of those different pieces can, um, can be um, regulated by the zone district. They can be regulated very similarly by an overlay. So there's the, you see the subtleties there? It's, it's either just a straight zone district or it's the underlying commercial with the added vision of the overlay. Yes? It would help me if you give the pros and the cons of the two proposals you're suggesting because sure. my initial reaction is, well, <laughs> if there's no difference, then what's the difference? So maybe you can help us. Absolutely. So it, it comes down to the applicant, staff, and, and you all in reviewing applications. So if an applicant comes in, um, I would say as an applicant coming in, reading through all the general commercial standards, meeting those, and then having to read through all the overlay standards can be cumbersome. So that's one um, pro to having them as uh, their own zone districts because it's all encompassed in, you know, you'd have a West, in West, West Manitou Avenue zone district and when you're developing in that area, you just go to one area and you know where all of your standards are. Um, I don't know that there's any particular cons I can think of other than just it, there's more zone districts. So some places like to have very succinct zone districts where you have a commercial zone district and a residential zone district. Um, but the way that you all manage your downtown area with the historic area and all the different character areas, you've already kind of set the precedent for you know, defining different specific characterized areas. So. Um, I, Julie, I've also gone back and forth on this in my head. At first I thought this read, the URA should just be its own zone district to simplify things. Then when we started talking about all the other areas, I thought, do we need four different zone districts, you know, different commercial zone districts or an overlay? And I think it's just a matter of simplifying from the applicant and review perspective if it's a zone district versus having to look through two sets of, of standards. Please, Julie, go ahead. So, um, oh, what the heck was I going to ask you? Oh, if we go with a brand new zone district as opposed to the overlay option, does that create any legal concerns as to having to, uh, like, have certain people opt out of the requirement because they're already in? non-compliance, you know, kind of a grandfather clause? Is that more difficult to grandfather non-complying uh, properties in if it's an overlay versus a zone district or it doesn't make a difference? No? So there's really very little difference other than what seems easier for the users. Correct. Thank yeah. you. Yep. And if we really want to create that character in the, the different character in those different areas, we have to use one of these mechanisms, I believe. So, thank you for those clarifying questions. Those were great. Yes. I don't know where this uh, possibly fits in here, but it seems like an awful lot of our zones, some of them are commercial districts that are right up against residential and things like that. And what I was wondering is if we could explore some options where the property lines are adjacent to a lower zoned area that we could ask the, shall we say, the more aggressive zone, let's say commercial, in those on that boundary area to actually respect the zoning requirements of the least, the most restrictive. So in other words, if we have a commercial area right up against a residential area or something like that, I guess I would like to propose that we write something in here where essentially that, it, th that more aggressive zoned area has to respect 
in on its boundaries ok where would that fit in terms of having a discussion about that absolutely um, there are several ways to do that one is um, require different setbacks at that at that juncture um, buffers there can be a required a buffer requirement for trees or shrubs or, or different things and there can also be an architectural requirement where if you're looking at like three-story buildings and the the residences behind are typically two-story where it needs to step back at a certain point um, so there there are many different tools we can use to uh, create that compatibility and transition between uses that that was the pretty much the presentation on zoning so you guys are asking all the right questions um, let's just open the floor for some conversation on this um, whether we have a, a preference on overlays versus um, just creating new zone districts for these different character areas yes yeah I didn't hear a pro at all for having an overlay so you know to me with the basic themes of simplifying the code it just seems like having three or four or whatever extra commercial districts, which may end up being very similar or the same anyway. So, and I also love John's idea about a transition between zones and something that we, to address that. So, so I, I'm bewildered as to why there are overlays. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, Tip. I think that one other advantage to going the zone route rather than the overlay route speaks a little bit to what Alan said in his introductory remarks and that's that of course people are going to be coming and asking for variances at all times but when you set out the guidelines the zone requirements right now in a new zone it imparts a certain kind of seriousness to the whole endeavor rather than having this overlay that sort of you know kind of uh, it more uh, a second layer it could be it creates a sense of ambiguity and this would be the city council saying this is what we want right now and at least for the foreseeable future it makes it easier for the planning commission to adhere to those standards and so i really do like that idea as well um, and then i also wanted to second um, the comment that uh, has already been bandied about uh, it's really important for there to be some kind of respect to neighboring jurisdictions or neighboring zones. And we have that language very clearly in the plan Manitou. And so I think that one thing we would want to do is bring that forward from the plan to create some kind of dialogue uh, uh, yet again between the code and the plan Manitou. And we also have that language is th uh, up there that you've already showed us for the commercial zone. Um, I think a lot of people don't even know that that exists in our code now. So this is an opportunity to bring that forward and accentuate it, highlight it, so that people really do know that it's something that's a requirement. And I think that you, so I think that that kind of pre, um, preface language is important to set out the um, more philosophical goals that we're trying to achieve. And then to stipulate, as you um, suggested, clear, um, very clear guidelines about the kinds of things we'd be looking at to ensure that kind of compatibility with adjacent zone zones, I think that makes a lot of sense. Coming, be, being built from that philosophical overview. Jennifer, did you want to respond? <laughs> I or, or Kristen? I actually have the response. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, Tip hits on, you, you, you hit on a fantastic point. Right now within the planning department, we're having this philosophical discussion of how does a plan Manitou review fit into a staff prepared report. And it's, it's very broad right now. And so we're, we're looking at how do we make sure that the staff person who's preparing just the plan Manitou review and relevancy of that application, and how does it fit within the intent of plan Manitou there, there's, you know, what, what I have noticed over years of staff reports that reference Plan Manitou specifically is that it, it varies widely. And I would like consistency and, uh, you know, a broader um, policy-based direction on that, which I think we could accomplish that. So I appreciate you bringing that up. It's 
Spot on. And, again, Commissioner uh, Armstrong and then and then Judith F. I looked like you were first, David, so. You know, I, I grasp the uh, idea of simplifying and as uh, Nancy said, she didn't hear any uh, big uh, pro points for uh, the overlays, but I'm thinking the the redevelopment area on the east side and downtown are so radically different. Jennifer and anyone else, is it your uh, expert opinion that uh, the same set of guidelines uh, really address it adequately um, for both areas? No. I don't think the same set of de design guidelines ad adequately address both areas. So. Um, even like last time we talked between the URA and the East End are very different. They're both zoned general commercial right now. So the, um, the best way at the current moment if we left zoning as is, downtown is a different, here let's go up, downtown does have a different zone district. So they do have a different set of uh, standards and regulations. So the downtown area is here in, in this pinky purple. Um, but then this would be all of that, you know, some of this is in the historic district and then some of this would be in that East End area. So um, right now, you're say we're saying all of this red can look the same, unless it has an overlay, or we just change that zoning to a different zone district. I hope that answered the question. I made the mistake of uh, equating downtown at, with commercial, but and then it's a very different uh, proposition. But are you still saying that uh, are you saying downtown needs to be different from commercial or various commercial areas need to be distingu distingu distinguished by their uh, requirements? Yeah, downtown would stay the zone district that it is. We may need to make a few tweaks to it for parking and landscaping and some other items. But yeah, I, w I was saying that this general commercial red, we would divide up into maybe four different zone districts okay. that would be similar to downtown where it's very clear what the character you know, characteristics of each of those areas are. So if you are developing in there or you're reviewing applications, it's it's just really clear. You're welcome. Yeah, I think Judith was next and then Alan. So I'm trying to get you in a fair order. Well, thank you, Mr. Armstrong, for asking one of my questions. Um, so in the spirit of the last time that we met a month ago, which I thought was one of the most productive work sessions I've ever attended, um, we talked about Manitou being a very small, homogenous community, but very various different areas are very different with their own personality, needs, desires, issues, concerns. And so I'm not an overlay fan. I'm very much a fan of the zone districts. And um, I, w w with, with the, uh, the idea of being very sensitive to, to what Councillor Shada said about, you know, when you have two um, districts butting up against each other to be very mindful to create um, some um, uh, some code language that addresses um, the lower density or or the lesser of the two um, uh, areas um, in a way that is both um, user friendly to both and and um, I'd like to see more of a um, I see Manitou becoming very chopped up. It's, it looks very chopped up to me. Like there's this, there's a three-story condo here, and there's a low density here, and a, a more of a, a, a more of a seamless community spirit kind of a, an attitude toward our town. And I, and I, I know we can achieve it. And I know that we talked about it last time. I really appreciate what um, it was, Mr. Uh, Reagan said about um, why are we allowing buildings to be any higher than two-story except in areas where there's like downtown so I think that we can I think we can get there um, but overlay is is not the way I think it's a zone district for me thank you okay Ellen yeah uh, first of all I, I do agree with uh, the what's been tossed out the notion of having some kind of buffer between dis disparate zones. I think Judith mentioned the 30-foot condo right next to a bungalow. And I would you know, go so far as to say that more than just have the lesser zone dominate, have some restrictions on, on that higher height to have it 
step back farther. And I, I would go farther, like, you know, I do like the idea of separate commercial zones because the downtown zone is so different. And the feedback I've gotten, the criticism I've heard of one particular project, one of the big criticisms, besides maybe the corporate look of it, is the height. And I think I look at the height of that building and it's not necessarily that much higher than a lot of other buildings, but the difference is it's only 10 feet from Manitou Avenue. And possibly when we look at these other commercial zone districts, we can consider a lower height within say 30 feet of the right of way. You know, because you can look at, you know, some of the, there are lots of much taller buildings in that hotel, but they're, step, they're set back, way back from the right of way and, and, they, and it's much less overwhelming. So that, that, I'd like to toss that into the mix too. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor John, Johnson. Um, so I also like the idea of the zones and part of that is because I know I'm sure we don't have time for this, but I just love the idea of playing with that and having some fun names, having a bit of the history attached to it. So I think of that East End as like the East End Auto Court. I still am gonna say again, I really like the neon. So I think that um, it'd be kind of fun to incorporate that in there, just for me personally. But. That's a great idea. Maybe we'll send out a questionnaire and get some, some names generated. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner, please. Commissioner Brobel. Yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned about this buffer as far as sound, um, not just the scale of buildings. I know that uh, a couple of years ago we had one come up where there was going to be some outdoor dining upstairs right next to some people's houses in a town that pretty much doesn't have air conditioning at least most of the older buildings near downtown don't. Um, I think we really do need to be um, careful and cognizant of, of that situation of people having a residence very close to a commercial district. You know, to me that we have a perfect example of it right now where it's so hot, everybody's got their windows open and sound I think is a real concern as well as just the scale and how it looks. You know, late at night, um, it's not real comfortable um, if there's a lot of noise and you've got something right next to your property and you're trying to sleep, but as hot as it is, everybody's got their windows open. So I'm just a little concerned about sound in addition to the, I, I definitely do not like the overlay. I like the idea of the separate districts. I think that's by far the best. Thank you. Wills. Okay, I guess we can push on. Awesome, we're right on time too. Thank you guys, that was that was perfect, very helpful. Okay, I'm gonna scroll ahead here and make us all have a headache. Um, all right, specific use standards. So I wanted to just lay the foundation with permitted uses versus conditional uses. I know I know you all have seen them come through your, your different um, meetings, uh, but just to kind of lay that foundation, so a permitted use is typically a use that's just permitted on a site, so something such as a single family home on a single family lot, that's a permitted use, it doesn't need to go through any additional um, hearing processes, so on and so forth. Um, there are several uses in, our, in the commercial areas that are uh, typically a permitted use where um, as long as you're meeting all of the, the requirements of that use, you, you, you know, it doesn't require any additional um, review. A conditional use, I know you all are very familiar with conditional use permits because you see a lot of them. Um, it's where it goes through, a, you know, there's an application process, goes through staff review, full public review, planning commission recommendation and board of county commissioners approval or um, don't know why that says board of county commissioners in this case, it would be <laughs> the, the council. So, um, and there's usually a set of, of um, compatible um, regulations or requirements to, to mitigate some of what we've been talking about. So um, usually there should, it should be, um, conditional use permits are usually used for uses that are a little more high intensity, uh, may have a larger impact in some fashion. And so it's, it's about the reason that they come through that full process is to ensure that the mitigation is there and that they're uh, developing in a proper fashion. So 
So with that in mind, um, we wanted to look at three different uses today that have kind of come to our attention. There's, there's certainly, um, I don't know, a hundred different uses listed throughout the code and, and a lot of them are pretty straightforward. Um, but food trucks have come to our attention as um, in the current code requiring a conditional use permit and Melissa got to sit in, my colleague got to sit in on one of those hearings and she said, why are food trucks a conditional use permit? It takes forever to get through the process and it's a temporary use. So I um, want to talk a little bit about that. Um, home occupations with COVID have become a little bit more um, uh, at the forefront of our minds to ensure that people can, you know, in these times where we're getting more quarantined, where people can still work from home, you know, a general professional office type use always can be done in the home, but we're talking other occupations such as um, hair salons, massage therapists, some of those lower intensity uses that can be done out of the home, making sure that they're um, accommodated in your code. And then short-term rentals. I don't want to talk a lot about short-term rentals, but I want to talk a little bit about it tonight. And Christine has some information about that that we'll share when we get to that one. But we're going to walk through these um, one at a time. So food trucks, food trucks currently require a major conditional use permit uh, for operation. Uh, the major conditional use permit process is lengthy, as I mentioned before. Um, and a lot of times uh, we can separate different uses such as food trucks as a temporary use permit. So we could still have a permit process that could be a little bit shortened that still has to come through some sort of review. Um, so that, that's one option for that one. Or um, uh, making, making, you know, like I said, a temporary use permit or some, some sort of process like that and attaching those conditions. So if you're seeing typical conditions that you're applying to these food trucks when they come in for their conditional use permit, we can codify those conditions as the standard. So um, say it's, it's about parking, you know, parking it in a certain location or providing access or, um, you know, this isn't usually in the zoning code, but ensuring that they're, um, um, uh, what am I looking for? <laughs> they're, 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 um, their waste, making sure that they're, you know, tied to a restaurant, so they're using an oil um, sand separator. Yeah, so a grease trap. That. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so um, any thoughts on this one um, with kind of changing that process a little bit? Um, I think when this came up a few years ago, there, was, there were a lot of concerns from the, the restaurants, right, that said, we're a tourist community. We only have three months to make our money. These food trucks can come in, they don't pay property taxes, they're here for those three months, and then they leave when there isn't money to be made, and it felt unfair. And so I don't know that they still feel that way. I feel like there's plenty of abundance happening here, but I would just be curious to hear where the chamber kind of stands on this issue, because I think it was intentionally difficult initially. That's good to know the history on that. Does anyone else have any thoughts, any other thoughts on this one? Ellen, yeah. please, and then Judith. Yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm not completely uncomfortable with have, con maintaining the conditional use process. And the reason is, again, this is that commercial residential boundary that often, you know, if, if it was just done administratively, it would leave some of the oversight out. And I think these things can be very impactful if, you know, if a food truck is right, you know, parked on the, by the park across from your house, it's, it's, it, it is a big deal. And I, I would be comfortable, at least in cases when it's not associated with a restaurant already and it's on their property, to, to still have a pro some kind of process, whether it's major or minor conditional use. I think there needs to be a public forum for the public to express their opinion. And I also, I, I'm not sure, you know, I've still heard people who do have bricks and mortar type things be a little ambivalent about having people roll into town for two months and and peel off their best business right by the parking lot that's on the way to the bricks and mortar stores. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Chandler. So I'm going to echo what uh, Mr. Dulwich said, uh, Commissioner Dulwich, and that is um, it, one of the things on my list of definitions to ask later is defining temporary. Because what's temporary? Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it nine months? I mean, 
we, we live in a community where really if you have a food truck or other, other um, non-permanent brick and mortar, you could operate quite a few months out of the year. So that's one of my issues is, is what is temporary. And also I'm, I am uh, just echoing what uh, Commissioner Dulwich said that I'm, I'm a little, little, a little um, concerned about not having a little bit more, more of a, a, a robust process in, in um, authorizing these and being very mindful that there is a community that um, has brick and mortar stores and to, to to, to deal with those concerns. But um, I think that if we're going to talk about a temporary um, food truck situation, we need to define, put that under our list of definitions as defining temporary. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. Who else, for the discussion or questions? Oh, Commissioner Robel. I usually see food trucks as being in an industrial zone. We don't have an industrial zone. I don't even think they fit. I mean, I understand people like to operate that business, and I understand them wanting to come in, but I don't think it's a fit for this community at all, just like we don't have an industrial district. You know, if we had an industrial district, park them in that district. We don't have one of those. So I think we definitely need the harder process to get through that because I just don't think it's necessarily good for the community unless there's something someone can really point out that this brings something to us that we don't have. I think it really hurts our brick and mortar um, community and I just don't even see it as a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Shada and, and Mr. Armstrong after that. I would uh, echo Jeannie's comment on that. Um, I think it is absolutely demonstratively true and the last time this happened was when we closed off Manitou Avenue. And right in front of our local brick and mortar um, businesses, there were out of town brew things right across the street from them, okay? A Mediterranean restaurant actually had a Mediterranean competitor right outside their front door. That was just beyond the pale to me, okay? All right. The other thing, too, is this use of bringing these things in has an inordinate amount of trash and garbage. And if this community says that it's just got this environmental ethic, these, these things are not environmental at all. They are not providing restrooms for people to clean up with. Their garbage and their trash in terms of all their cups and food and food that's half eaten are all piled up for our staff to clean up in a huge way. And to me, this is not a use that we ought to be encouraging even for special events, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I am definitely in a minority here. Uh, Jeannie, Jeannie uh, I think uh, food trucks uh, trucks can add a great deal to community. I know uh, where my children live in Portland, Oregon. Um, it is a it's a huge asset to neighborhoods. Now, Portland is a very different place from uh, Manitou, at least in size. Uh, maybe not so much in mood. Um, and I, when I read this in the um, when Christine sent out this uh, advance information in advance, I thought. Yeah, spending all this time on major conditional use um, of permits really doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Natalie, if, if the idea is to protect existing businesses, to me, there's something dishonest about just making it difficult for the trucks. Uh, and so, anyways, I think that's a very good idea, and there, I think there's a way to... Uh, protect what several of you mentioned, uh, that when a, a robust discussion is required to re and, re and review, uh, that that could also be accomplished without making it uh, always a major conditional use permit. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bremner? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David, for bringing up Portland. I spent a lot of time in Portland last year. My daughter lives there. And I've seen those trucks in Portland. 
But the difference, I think, between Portland and Manitou is in Portland, they, they segregate them. They put them all together in one place. And they've got it like a zone for food trucks. Like you might have five food trucks in one place. So you can go up there and just have your smorgasbord to choose which one you want to have. I am in favor of food trucks in general. Um, I remember uh, during the campaign in 2016, one of the, one of the Mexican uh, people that was for Trump said, oh, if you, if you uh, let the Mexican, Mexicans come in, there'll be a food truck on every corner. I don't know if you remember that. But I, I thought, great, let's have a food truck on every corner. I love food trucks. But for Manitou, I think it's, there's really no place to put them. I'd like to see food trucks be tied to an existing business. For instance, with the Tava truck that we allowed, it's tied to an existing business. That way you could have the best of both worlds. You're not taking business away from a brick and mortar, but you give a brick and mortar an opportunity to have a different menu. Uh, for instance, when we have an epidemic, which you'll probably have more in the future, you know, they can say, okay, we're gonna put a, a truck out here in front of our place make it easier for people to come in, they don't have to sit down, that kind of thing. So that's my two cents. Good, thank you. Additional comments? Uh, Christine. This is a great dialogue about food trucks. I'd like to share um, from a practical perspective some of the questions we're getting in the planning department and other communities across the country about food trucks. So food trucks are very popular right now for parties, right? So if you have your eight-year-old's birthday party or a soccer party, you're hosting something at your house, you may have a cupcake truck, you may have a taco truck, it pulls up in front of your driveway, um, and it, it's very popular. And so that that is the, some of the type of questions we receive, you know, um, for an event that's three to four hours, no more than five hours in length. Are these permissible? Um, we have special events that reserve Memorial Hall or the parks and questions about food trucks that can be here. So instead of bringing in a catering firm that would utilize kitchen, do whatever might we traditionally think a catering firm would do, instead folks are um, gravitating towards wanting to bring food trucks to special events. So that is one of the types of uses of food trucks that we're receiving a lot of questions about. And so I think as we move through this, it's a discussion about, you know, do we have food trucks once a month? Do we never have any food trucks? Can people have them in our community, in their neighborhood, associated with a birthday party or a wedding? You know, what does that look like? So I wanted to share that with you because that's an experience and a use that hasn't come up yet in the discussion that we're seeing quite a quite robust um, call, number of calls and emails about. Good, thank you. Any further comments while we're in this? Uh, Tip. Thank you, um, Christine. I, I haven't seen anything like you describe come in front of the Planning Commission. Uh, the ones we've seen in the Planning Commission that have been some, I should also say, I like food trucks. I'm, I'm with you, uh, <laughs> Steve. I like food trucks, and at first I was like, oh, well, you know, food trucks, that would be fine. I'm hearing things from my colleagues that make me reconsider that, which is one of the good things about having these kinds of meetings. Um, but, so uh, the, I have, I have been, been on planning where we've had, I remember two cases, someone who wants a food truck that would not be five hours but would be, you know, three months in a residential street. That's happened twice, and we ended up saying no, but we spent a lot of time on the case deciding that we should uh, not recommend that use. The cases that you give, a birthday party for five hours or someone who's uh, rent renting the park or whatever, personally, I think that's fine. Um, and I wouldn't see, I wouldn't put that in the category of this kind of conditional use, which I think of as much more of an ongoing business for something like one month, two months, or three months. That seems to me categorically of a different order. And so it's good for you to raise these issues so that maybe we would separate them out 
Um, I think that uh, John Shada's issue about environment is really important here. You know, the use of styrofoam, for example, and all of these kinds of things, besides the trash. Maybe even for the, what I would take lighter use, maybe a five-hour birthday party, as long as they don't go at, you know, we had an in uh, hour at night or, or something to protect the neighbors. But maybe um, in the stipulations for that kind of uh, limited use, that could probably, I think, be approved administratively. It would be good, I think, to have language that prevents these kinds of environmental disastrous um, types of actions um, or practices. So I would separate those things out for the, this would be my, just listening to this, I'd separate those kind of sh shorter term, very specific things out to be administratively approved, but with clear ex uh, stipulations about hours and the environmental issues. And then the ones that are more than um, a day uh, that's an ongoing kind of thing, that that would um, come the way it has uh, in the past. That would be my suggestion. Good, thank you. Got some good discussion here, a lot of good ideas, folks. So, uh, Julie. Yeah, uh, this is just food for thought. I, I don't disagree with Tip, but as he was talking, I was thinking, oh, okay, well, if I'm going to make some decent money allowing a food truck to park in my driveway, we can have a little party every Saturday. And just think about all the neighbors who can buy food in my driveway from the food truck so they don't have to go down and spend money at the Loop or the Armadillo. They can buy from me in my driveway. And this week it's an anniversary party, and next week it's my dog's you know, birthday and whatever. So uh, we need to look philosophically, I think, at the bigger picture, too, of what, what we want, and then just to make sure there's not you know, opportunity for abuse. Um, with these, you know, little one-day special exception things. Good, thank Just you. Food for thought as you're drafting. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I love the pun there, too. Um, you guys have had, this is enlightening. This has been very, very helpful for us. And I, I did think of one, one thing as we've been talking. Is there a location in town that is more suitable for food trucks. I know some communities actually set up like little food truck parks um, and that that's the only location that you can have your food truck so they're never parked on the street or, um, you know, I guess they could be in a parking lot of a, of a restaurant, but is, are there locations that it, they would be more appropriate in or am I hearing no, not really? Because we can kind of regulate based on location as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay, I, my question that kept coming up in my head was to throw it back at the consultants to ask, have you identified appropriate, not appropriate, any locations that it would even be reasonable to consider this entire conversation of whether to have a conditional use permit? And I'm hoping you have. We, we haven't specifically looked at locations yet. I mean, we're very familiar with the different areas of town, and I'm just trying to visualize, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you all that it's, it would be very few and far between. I don't know if, if staff, if you've heard of any. You know, I think, I think reasonably to that point, there aren't many locations. You know, we think about, we have the, um, the fields, um, over near Becker's Lane, you know, so what if there's a game? Is it reasonable for a food truck to pull up? What would we issue one? Would we issue two? Would we issue none? Um, but primarily, you know, from my, from my perspective and thinking through this and fielding some of the calls and the concerns, really special events seem to be the, the only real practical opportunity for the community. We don't have as you know, that we don't have a lot of space to have a food truck park. And I don't know that there's a movement out there for it. Um, so I would definitely not advocate for identifying one. Good. Thank you. Uh, Natalie? Oh, I'm sorry. I think food trucks can sometimes be used as startups. You know, so if we do want restaurants to get kind of a toehold in Manitou and then move to that brick and mortar moment, I think we might want to then look at that possibility of saying, okay, if we do want restaurants in the URA or we do want rest restaurants on the West End, maybe figuring out a way to have a food truck experimentally in those spaces to kind of see how that works. 
And so I think that's maybe something to consider. Thank you. Carrie? I'd just like to also say, when you think about the food truck coming in and taking parking away from the businesses already, you know, it's not just taking the customers away from restaurants, it's taking parking away from the non-restaurants. And it's such a premium, it really is just a kind of a double whammy. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Denise. Yeah, that's what was one of my comments. I just was the parking, and then if you have a food truck in some of these neighborhoods, it's gonna be really challenging for emergency vehicles. So I think we really have to think about that as you maneuver through this, and it's a great idea to have it, but when we have very, you know, I can think of some roads that a food truck is not gonna allow emergency vehicle to get through, and then what do we do in those circumstances? So just something to consider. Good, thank you. Anything else while we're on food trucks? Okay, if not, we've got, it's a few minutes past seven. Um, Christine, I guess I look to you for a little direction as to whether you wanna hit the next topic or you wanna take the break now. This might be a good time to give a couple minutes for public input, if there are any comments, and then we could go into home occupations. Short-term rentals will probably be a robust dialogue, just as this was. So okay. that's what I would okay. recommend. Okay, great. So this is our, our experimentation with uh, entertaining public comment. So we do have two people in the audience. Uh, this would be an opportunity if you'd like to address council and, uh, and the planning commission. Um, if you can, you know, some, we'd entertain, entertain brief comments. You don't need to feel like you have to. Okay, we're not getting any takers. Okay, but we're trying. I mean, we're trying to make it av available. And, and for anyone who's uh, listening at home, uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to email uh, the city planner, and uh, she'll compile those uh, remarks. Okay, Christine, back to you. Back to Jennifer. Um, <laughs> Let's have a little bit of fun. All right, home occupations. So currently, things kind of um, allowed businesses in, in the current code are you know things such as craft work, uh, pottery and jewelry, garment work, tailoring, dressmaking, um, office facilities for sales representatives, repair services for small electronic um, and mechanical appliances, tutoring, music lessons artistic endeavors, art studios, um, photography studios, and then daycare, like in-home daycare. Uh, some of the uses that uh, come to our attention quite often on codes are, like I said before, more of your home salon, uh, spa type situation, um, hair studio, that type of thing. So our this, this one is just our, our main recommendation is just to allow um, some of those type of uses that you may have one, uh, typically one um, customer at a time, and it's not a huge impact to the, to the neighborhood. Now, I realize hairdressing, kind of that type of use, um, some communities still think it's a little too intense because you could have eight different, you know, eight or 10 different um, customers in a day, depending on the, the hours that someone might be running. Um, but it is generally a use that's allowed in a home occupation. So I wanted to throw that out for discussion, see if that's something we wanted to add to our home occupations or just leave them as they are. Okay. Councilor Chandler. Uh, you know, I don't have a, um, I don't have a tremendous um, opposition against home salon and spa uses with the exception of a lot of home salons use a lot of toxic chemicals and um, that, are, that, that, that are quite putrid smelling. And I, whether it's a perm or acrylic nails or those kinds of things that are dangerous. So I, I really wanna make sure that we address that issue. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying that I, I'm, I'm opposed to that. I just think we need to think about um, you know, if we had a, if, if you know, if you had a salon next to your home or several salons, um, would that would that be would that be an issue? 
Um, the other thing I wanted to just throw out there, and this is not um, about home salons, but I, I was listening to NPR this week, and I don't know if um, you caught the um, piece on home businesses, and they were talking about one of the number one home businesses is home bakeries, home um, people that are putting commercial kitchen, kitchens in and baking pies, pastries, cakes, cookies, and selling them to um, grocery store outlets and, and grocery stores, and I just... Um, it's a real uh, up and coming and very thriving business for some people. So I was, wanted to throw that out as a possible idea to consider on our list. Thank you. Thank you. Julie? If this is going to be allowed, I'd much rather be next to a bakery than a smelly salon because that those smells are so horrible. That would be really bad, especially if you had the windows open. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but I was just going to say... I have some concerns similar to the discussion on the food truck where we've got these buildings in town and there is people paying money so that they can, you know, uh, rent the space to run their hair salon. And I'm like, oh, I'll charge $10 less. Come to my house. And so I'd be concerned about the impact on businesses um, by offering that. I would also be uh, concerned about the impact on parking. So I'd want there to be really stringent off-street parking only requirements. And, you know, people come back to back. You know how that is. You, they're running 15 minutes over. You've got a couple of cars. Sometimes you got to bring your kids because you don't have a babysitter. I wouldn't want that on my residential street. So I, I, I'm not in favor of um, kind of further blurring the distinction between residential and commercial. Uh, but if so, I would have those concerns about the odors <laughs> and the um, and just the fairness to those brick and mortar uh, tenants and and property owners. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, another factor. I think it, you know we've heard over and over with, and I know we're going to talk about short term rentals later. But we've heard the refrain from neighborhoods like. I thought this was residential. Why is there a hotel next door to me? I think we're going to get the same feedback if it becomes a use by right, which essentially we've done with short-term rentals. It's, yeah, you have to go through a process, but if you have parking, pretty much you get it. And I think if we just say, oh, yeah, we'll do administrative review, and if you meet parking, you can have a business next door to someone's house, you might get a lot of disappointed people. So I think we need to be real careful and um, think about, you know, maybe not adding to the permitted use. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Johnson, please. And I'm, I'm going to go the other route. Um, I think that all of these services are small services that support the residents and not the tourists, and I don't know that they're ever going to be able to pay those downtown prices um, for rental spaces, and so I think it would be terrible if a tailor had to shut down and I just had to drive somewhere else to get there. So I don't know, I just wanted to keep that in mind. Okay, Mr. Bremner. Yeah, I'd just like to point out an actual instance we had of, of somebody running an acupuncture business on Fairview Avenue recently. I don't remember if it came before city council, but it was an issue with the neighbors up there. I had, had quite a few people coming to me because parking for one, and I know that uh, our police department actually went up there and coned off some of the spaces saying no parking. And I know that uh, Mr. Jenkins, who owned, who still owns the property across the street with the tennis court, he had to block off and, and cone off his area to stop people from parking there. And I understand that the person who was actually operating that business has, has put his place up for sale. So we had a lot of opposition from the neighborhood. Uh, and I think that's going to be a general case uh, for most neighborhoods in Manitou Springs. If somebody's coming there and has lots of clients coming in and out, constant traffic, uh, I just think it's a, it's a um, difficult situation. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Mayor Partem. Thanks. Um, I, I, again, I'm hearing the concerns, but I too am something of a supporter of at-home businesses because I do think that they serve primarily residents, and if that could be a condition in some way, that would be great. Um, I would also like to piggyback on the um, bakery, you know, at-home bakery. 
to expand that to things like jams, jellies, candies, you know, uh, pickles. There's all kinds of things that people are producing in their homes now. Now they typically take them to farmers markets, but some people sell out of their home as well. So um, I would just hate. I, I think it's very different from um, short-term rentals, um, but I, I also am very concerned about the parking concerns. So I don't know how to balance that. And we have a tie here. I guess we'll have Kerry go and then Tip. Just to add on to your comments, I just to add on to those comments, I guess the question is, especially like with the jams, jellies, if somebody's saying I'm putting in a commercial kitchen, then do they, is it okay for them to bring employees in? And then, I mean, that's the slippery slope I'd worry about. It's not just the, the you know, a customer coming in. Or what if, wow, we're doing great. We're going to have more than one. And yeah. And if I could just say that um, we, yes, on. We, um, I know that back when we did have the farmer's market in town, we did bring in folks from the state to um, go through all the, considerations that you need to do to have an at-home kitchen for um, and it and it doesn't necessarily entail putting in a commercial kitchen so there are conditions that can be put on it thank you tip I, I think that part of the diff difficulty in this discussion is that the category strikes me as too broad uh, we've had people who want to open child care facilities in their home and you know, off of Crystal Park and whatnot, and that just seems so, to my mind anyway, and I think to the my, my um, colleagues on the Planning Commission didn't seem that appropriate, although maybe Mike will remind me that we did approve one one time. I can't remember, I think we did. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the aftermath of that made me rethink whether that was such a good idea. If we could separate the, the, th the things out, um, and figure out kind of what are the principles that you would allow certain kinds to take place and other ones not, then we would, I think, be in a better position. Um, as the mayor pro tem said, I'm sympathetic to something like, um, you know, somebody's making um, jam or pies and taking it and selling it at Ranch Foods Direct. I think that's great. And even more than that, I would say that kind of artisanal production, it seems to me, fits in the character of Manitou. And that's something that we haven't really discussed in this particular um, in this particular chapter, but we are all very attentive to what the the character about the importance of having things fit into the character, um, and to me, some of those kind of small things. But maybe you don't let them sell out of their house. Uh, that could be one thing. Or I I definitely hear about the smells with the with the hair. To me, maybe that just wouldn't be on the short list of things that could be used. So again, I guess that my point. I don't think we're going to be able to. Think of every possible, mm, in every possible use and contingency tonight in a few minutes, but maybe if you guys were thinking a little bit about what makes sense, what w how could we tailor something narrow that would fit with the character of Manitou, what would prevent problems of parking and uh, tr transportation, all that, then maybe we would be in the point where we could be doing a service. Um, while also um, guaranteeing that there wouldn't be abuses or there wouldn't be the negative impacts that we fear would happen in the community. Good, thank you. More comments? More ideas? Okay. Guess not. It's quarter after seven. Do you want to push on to the next topic or do you want to take a break? Anybody opposed to taking a break now? Okay, let's go ahead and take a 10, 15 minute break. It's, it looks quarter after, let's figure and be back about uh, 25 after. Thanks.
Okay, if we could kind of take our seats and uh, reconvene. Well, I want to thank everybody for the discussion. I think this is, we're making good progress. We're having intelligent comments, and uh, there's candy coming around to keep our a little brain sugared up. So, um, I guess. What's your favorite? Okay. Good. Christine? Okay, if we can get started again, please. Okay, so let's continue with the fun and games. We are uh, complete with home occupations. We'll um, put our nose to the grindstone on that one and continue um, examining that. There are also some other interesting items that we can look at. Uh, Colorado has a cottage industry uh, law, and so we, no, we don't have to. I just wanted to add that. Um, so now let's move to short-term rentals. You know, short-term rentals are certainly an interesting topic. As those who are watching know and those who are participating in this meeting, we have a moratorium on short-term rentals. The moratorium came about um, really because there wasn't clear direction in the process where to go. Um, prior to COVID, beginning in 2019 and rolling into 2020, there was a public engagement process there had been small group meetings. There had been a large community meeting. I say large, it wasn't that large, but it was considered at the time large. Now we know we can get much more robust participation over Zoom at times. But um, the second in-person community meeting was postponed due to COVID, um, which, was, which was fine because there wasn't clear direction coming out of the community engagement. And we had discussion at city council or excuse me, at Planning Commission, which resulted in a recommendation for a moratorium. Um, staff had brought forward some recommendations, I believe in 2019, early in the year. That is still out there and could certainly be considered and is quite relevant to the discussion. But for purposes tonight, um, I'll turn it back over to Jen and let's begin. I think it's really important to understand from this these two bodies, what your perspective is on short-term rentals, the role of them in the community, and really from a broad policy perspective, what it is we want to accomplish. Great, that was very helpful, Christine. Um, so this conversation, I know short-term rentals can be a giant conversation, but within the code, it's really quite narrow. Um, it's more about, um, Currently, your current regulations have a 500-foot separation between short-term rentals. Uh, that's pretty common in a lot of communities. Um, and we just wanted to look at, you know, based on the history of short-term rentals and where you would like to see them go, if there are other areas that we need to regulate, such as a saturation for certain neighborhoods, I, you know, in addition to the 500-foot separation, is it, you know, do we want to regulate um, only a certain um, percentage in certain areas. Um, and then uh, Mark was telling me recently about, is it Kansas City, Kansas or Missouri? That, or no, maybe it wasn't Kansas City, that they do the conditional use permit beyond a saturation point. So it can be a permitted use if you're you know, under 10% in a certain area or something. Um, but if you get above 10% of the dwelling units as short-term rentals, I'm just using 10% as an example, then it would go to a conditional use permit to decide if that was um, appropriate for that area. So um, I do want to open the, the floor for a conversation on this and just get 
basic policy direction from you all, um, you know, if it's, do we, do we not want any more short-term rentals? Do we like our 500-foot separation? Do we need any other standards or regulations or processes in place? So. Okay, with that, uh, Ellen? Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen, then we'll get Mike, okay? Yeah, um, I absolutely love the 500-foot separation. I'd hate to lose it. Um, one of the things that I've heard over and over when we've had the public hearings, that one of the big concerns besides the fact that people don't want them next door to their house, is if they're not owner-occupied. And I would toss out maybe a consideration that going forward, we only allow owner-occupied ones. I mean, this is, this is the model ordinance that Denver has, and it seems to be very successful there, and we might consider at least batting that around and seeing if you know that would be one way to make them at least more palatable when one shows up next door to you, you at least know the operator is going to be there and not living in Woodland Park or living in Maine or somewhere else and being managed by a professional company. Okay, thank you. Mike? Um, I agree that this is a topic that could we could talk about for a long time, but some of us um, were involved with the before, middle, and after of this of the short-term rentals and in my two minutes or less is that it was kind of the wild wild west and then we there was a moratorium and then we came up with an ordinance and um in hindsight you know when, when you, you learn from what you've done and the i think the ordinance we, we painted ourselves into a corner it's 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 kind of a checklist and if somebody meets the criteria that's in the ordinance then it's approved and 35 homeowners could be adamantly opposed to a specific rental, and according to our ordinance, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and I, I, and so why even make it a conditional use if, if we can't uh, look at in rentals on an individual basis and make an individual decision on each one? I mean, there, there's gotta be some more flexibility built into the ordinance or it should, should just be administratively approved. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, and then Carrie. Yeah, um, I, I w watched the short-term rental um, discussions that happened several years ago, and um, as well as in other communities. And um, at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, the homeowners should be able to do what they want kind of sort of minimally regulated. But I've done something of a 180. So speaking from a purely philosophical standpoint for Manitou, um, uh, if short-term rentals, the, the challenge of, or the possibility of destroying the integrity of our neighborhoods and our community is, is so great. And also I, I'm the council liaison to the Housing Advisory Board and um, uh, the, it's critical that we have sufficient housing for our residents. Um, so I, I just, that, again, philosophically, um, I think it's critical that whatever we do, we absolutely maintain the integrity of our neighborhoods and our community. And too many communities have been torn apart because um, of short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie? Thank you. Um, I would also, I think I, I support um, Commissioner Dulwich's idea about having somebody on site in, in as, as a way to kind of manage the rental. I have to admit I've got one across the street from me, and the last this last several weeks we've been up until midnight with somebody out partying on the deck, throwing up in the creek. You know, it's just, it's it's. If it's your, if it's a neighbor, and you, you could go over, hey Jim, you know, can you? But it's these the, an endless rotation every, you know, five seven days of a new crowd looking to party, and it, it's just, it really is uncomfortable in the neighborhood. And the other thing, when we when we have things come before us as a commission, and they're talking about, well, we really need to think about our housing and what how we're going to get more places for more people in our community echoing your idea I and mean, your thoughts. I mean, 
we're, every time there, a short-term rental takes away a place for a family in our community, it's, it's, it becomes a cash machine. And I, I, I do agree with you, it, it, it destroys the fabric of the community. Not a fan. Thank you. Thank you. Tip? I would, uh, I, I won't echo everything my colleagues have said, but I am in agreement with much of what they said. I would back up and say that I do think that the process that led to the decision that we made at the time was, it was the Wild West, I guess. That's true. I, th I seem to remember that. Um, I was someone at the time, I will confess, that thought when we had a pretty, um, when we had pretty clear-cut stipulations, some of you may remember it, I suggested that it be ha handled administratively. Um, and uh, that, I realize, in retrospect, was incorrect because the, the, there have been a number of occasions when um, a request met the stipulations, but because of parking and all this other stuff, they have ended up being denied, um, and I thought with good reason. The thing I will say is that let, we should keep in mind that a number of um, cities in the United States, I use, uh, we all, I'm sh many of us use uh, vacation rentals by owner. I'm not uh, opposed to them completely. I just think they need to be um, few and far between and regulated. Um, we've seen that there have been studies of a number of communities in the United States that have been completely ruined by, um, a, a, by a saturation. We should keep that in mind. and. Um, I think that the, the 500 feet ended up being wise, the 2% ended up being wise. I think that um, listening to Carrie's story, that gives fuel to the, the fire that uh, Alan is proposing. I think that's something that is well worth um, considering. The one, thing that I, 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 the one thing that I hope that we also will keep, and I understand there's some dissatis dissatisfaction, but I was strongly in favor and continue to be uh, strongly in favor of the same requirements across the whole city of Manitou. Because otherwise, it ends up pitting neighborhood against neighborhood. I will just, some of you will recall that when there was a proposal years ago to do a different kind of development across the street from us on Grand Avenue, and I have some people, uh, colleagues here who are, live on the same street I do, Grand Avenue, people all over the rest of the city were totally willing to have whatever happened because they wanted the tax money or the, you know, whatever. Um, and we were always characterized as the NIMBYs and all that kind of stuff. And it still, you can tell by my voice, it still rankles me, the pitting neighborhood versus p a neighborhood. And the fact that we kept things low, I think that every neighborhood can have one every 500 feet and it does not ruin the neighborhood unless we have to address that issue. But um, in principle, it's that the, the kind of, the benefits and the sacrifice are across the whole community. Let's preserve the integrity. I don't want people to say, oh, well, you people who live in Agate Hill are close to the downtown, so you can, you know, like, let's just have 90% uh, of your places. And this is something that we really need to consider because as we know, property values are going up and there's go a lot and there's going to be increasing pressure for some people to come and buy in the community because they know they can make a lot of money in vacation rentals. And so I think that, so I would like to pat ourselves on the back and say, generally speaking, job well done. We did the moratorium before, we had a big discussion, we arrived, I think, at very reasonable uh, stipulations. I understand some people would like to rent more and all that, well, yeah, I, I can understand that. But to me, I think we did a good job and I, I really appreciate it. I hope that we keep that more or less as the guidelines going forward. Good, thank you. Additional comments? Julie. I have a question, not a comment. Am I remembering correctly that there were only like four or five more potential um, Airbnb uh, short-term rentals available in the city uh, based on our current code? That's correct. To, okay. to, to Tip's point, I will, I will say that with the way the real estate market has been, we receive many calls and inquiries about the ease of which you could buy a property and turn it into a short-term rental. We receive many calls about that and inquiries. So, you know, the intended goal was to hold off that, and you're right, you did, you did a good job on that. Then, okay, in terms of my comment, um, I'm happy with the code as it is. 
I don't want to expand the opportunities for additional short-term rentals whatsoever. Um, with respect to the remaining four properties, if there's a new, you know, provision in the code that says, uh, you know, the owner has to live there at least X number of weeks per year, God knows who the heck is going to monitor that. That's ridiculous. We can't even monitor our own code enforcement. Now, I mean, the city's growing in so many projects, so, you know, it's more of a theoretical thing. But if theoretically we say that the new short-term rentals must uh, be owned by someone that lives there, you know, at least 10 months of the year, I, that wouldn't bother me. But I, I certainly wouldn't want to do anything to the code that would increase the uh, numbers of additional short-term rentals that we would authorize. We'll do uh, Natalie first and then back to Christine. Um, so I agree with everything that's been said too. So I'm just kind of curious, as far as the pros, like what are the pros in this situation? I mean, the property owners make money, the property becomes commercial and we make more money. What are the other, like what, we they, they stay in town, they don't stay in a B&B &B in Colorado Springs. Like what? what is the, I, I don't know, do you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to, Make yeah. sure we're yeah, sure. Ned Lanley, I think maybe Alan can speak pretty quickly to that. Yeah, the one I've heard from um, some vacation rental wannabes is they fix up the property. We have long-term renters in some places where they get run down, and, and, and it's a legitimate argument, but I mean, it's a tr it's, it is true if you look at historically where people have have uh, created short-term rentals, they do fix up the properties. But the cost is we lose our residential flavor, people can't live there, there's less housing for people who want to live in town, and, and then all the other ramifications that Carrie's brought up and so on. But that's the, argu the one argument I've heard that's a pro. Good, thank you. And Christine, you wanted to speak. Since a number of you were not a part of uh, the Planning Commission at the time that would have received the draft ordinance that Senior Planner Michelle Anthony had circulated that had some, some of these incorporated thoughts and ideas, would it be helpful for me to circulate that to this entire group? Mm. Planning Commissioners are all nodding their heads, so I'll go with that. So I'll circulate that. Is um, it a redlined um, version so we can see how it's changed? Okay, thanks. Yes, it is. And it was reviewed by Jeff Parker. So um, it, it's been through some pretty substantial vetting, I think, from a legal perspective. So then we could have a, a robust philosophical discussion. Okay, thank you. And I guess from my perspective, um, I'm wondering, in a case like Carrie's, when, when you have a, when you're living in close proximity to a vacation rental unit and you have problems, what's, uh, what's our, uh, what redress do they have? Uh, right, I mean, and, 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 I mean, that's maybe not a question to be answered here, but it's a question to be answered in the future. How do we, how do we protect the integrity of neighborhoods? We've all, many of us have expressed concern about, you know, the neighborhood integrity. I think a reasonable approach that many communities have taken and was some of the prior discussion is that those residents, those those individuals staying at a short time, short term residence um, would be subject to the same community standards and laws as any other residents. So when are quiet hours, the trouble becomes enforcing it. You'd have to call the police. And is that something that wants to be done? And I see a couple of heads shaking, so I would. Yeah, a tip? I think that there are two things, uh, just to, quickly. One would be that if there is somebody that is carrying on at midnight, that um, someone would have recourse to call the police and have someone go and put it into it. That has to do with the person doing the renting. But the, the, the problem is really the person who is renting out. And the conditional uses are given, and they say, if you do not abide by the stipulations, you run the risk of losing your license to operate as a conditional use. We, we should take that very seriously. If there is a property owner next door to you and you've had to call five times in a season, 
then we, we should have some idea about what the stipulation would be. But if I would think that if you've been called on five times, that the city simply takes away your conditional use, and then that makes one available to someone else who wants it, who can fix up the property and uh, you know pay taxes and, and do all that kind of stuff, and that'd be great. Thank you. Julie? And there's no one to call at night. You can call that silly phone number that John Shada told us about in the email today, that useless mm -hmm. thing. But what are you going to do, call 911? They're going to arrest you for calling 911 when they're supposed to be uh, charge you because they're supposed to be helping people who are being murdered. So uh, there is no recourse. It is a practical matter. And, you know, how many neighborhoods have the wherewithal to go out you know, in the middle of the night with your camera, get dressed, go outside, videotape the whole damn thing, and then have to come before a planning commission and try to convince staff to somehow put it on the schedule to have a meeting about revoking the conditional use permit. It's a pain in the neck. Um, it's just not realistic to say, oh, call the, you know, call five times. Who the heck are you supposed to call? Anyway, I don't think we have a system that's set up to manage the problems that arise, or at least to manage it well. Okay, and then maybe that's something we need to give some thought to. Maybe that's part of this, and, and maybe it needs some augmentation elsewhere in, in city functions. And I think those are good points. I mean, really, you know, it's, it's one thing to move into a neighborhood where you know there's an airport. It's another thing to move into a quiet neighborhood in Manitou and find that they brought the airport to you. That's not kosher. We need to fix that. That's, that's my two cents. Uh, David. I, I do want to just uh, correct a misapprehension there. Um, I've complained. I, I call the police number. They transfer me to uh, the sheriff, and the sheriff sends somebody out. And I've done it many times with bars downtown who do not respect the noise ordinance. That means you, you shut down at, nine, at 10 o'clock, or at least you shut the windows. <laughs> so... Uh, that works. It certainly worked for me, Julie. Okay. Uh, Councilor Chandler? So, it, you know, it, I, I was trying to keep a really open mind about this particular issue tonight. Um, we do have a, a short-term rental in a close proximity to our house um, that we haven't had any problems with, but um, I see the same problem with short-term rentals that I have with long-term rentals, right? So we have people that are, you know, partying and loud and throwing up in the creek, and we have some long-term rentals that um, we've had some amazing problems with a long ongoing. So I, I want to just have us be mindful that the, um, the, the code that we apply to short-term rentals must also apply to the landlords of long-term rentals. Um, I just want to go back and reiterate that um, I support Commissioner Delwich's comment about owner-occupied short-term rentals. And I, uh, it sound, this is a really hot-button issue, and I, I would be fine <laughs> with uh, Manitou Code uh, stipulating that um, all short-term rentals must have 100% owner-occupied rental. Uh, no uh, further, no no less than 500 feet separation from uh, the next short-term rental. So I I am not opposed to that. I just want us to have a, a, a conversation about um, the same the same um, stipulations to long-term rentals that we've had some problems with. The other thing that I want us to and and this can go under the definitions because it was on my list for definitions um, because people have been asking a lot about. What's the difference between a short-term rental and an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit? And we haven't talked about that. I mean, that's not in this packet, but I just want to be th uh, ha us to be putting our thinking caps on about that because those two are, you know, sometimes that's a very gray area in communities between um, S uh, STRs and ADUs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson? I have a quick question. If you sell a property that's a short-term rental, does that go with that sale? So in theory, those properties could be worth $100,000 more than another property? Okay. Uh, Alan, do you want to 
delve into the details? Oh, yeah, that's just, it, when we redid the ordinance about five years ago, we added that, that it runs with the land. There are some that are grandfathered in that, that predate the, the ordinance, and they don't have that. And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, one thing to keep in mind, you know, we might say, well, there's only five left. Do we want to change the ordinance? But going forward, sometimes people decide to stop doing it. We've had several people apply, have their license, and they do it for two years and decide it's a pain. They want to move to Durango or something. And so I think it's a, it's a, a good candidate, even with so few left, you know, because over the years, as they age out, they, new people, if they come in, they have to be owner-occupied. We can't force, at least I don't think we can make people who already have them, you know, can, you know, follow new laws. That just wouldn't fly. But at least going forward, if we had that over time with attrition, we'd have fewer and fewer unmanaged residential hotels is how I like to think of it. Good. Thank you. Uh, Julie? Thanks. Um, I think you're right, Alan. I, I wanted to make that point as well because if people here are thinking that we could change, you know, the law that would affect all short-term rentals in Manitou, it's my understanding that with the exception of the four or five that haven't been snapped up yet, uh, we can't retroactively change what we did. We already told them this property forever and ever and ever is always going to be a short-term rental if you want it to be as long as you comply with these little details. So no matter who owns it. Uh, so I don't think we can legally go back and say, oh, by the way, uh, now you have to find somebody to live in the house eight months of the year, you know, <laughs> or something. I don't think you can retroactively change that. So we're really just talking about what to do about the remaining three or four, or if we want to change, you know, the entire, you know, open it up. I agree with your point, Alan. I think it would be a wise move to still tighten up the code so that when we do have new applications, because folks have just let their CUP lapse, then it would be nice for the new owners to have to obey the new rules. But we're really not talking about an impact that's going to affect very many people unless we expand the code at this point. Good, thank you. I believe Christine, you have a response? Or Sure, I just have some data to add to that. I just completed an audit of the number of their short-term rentals, and right now, and this is gonna be relevant to Planning Commission here in about a week and a half, but right now, approximately 50% of the short-term rentals have that stipulation that it runs with the land. There were a number of short-term rentals that went through the CUP process about 12 years ago that um, it did not run with the land, and upon sale, then that conditional use expired. I was under the impression that they changed the code while I was still on planning commission because I voted against it. I was on the losing end of that vote. I thought they changed the code to say all of the properties are going to run with the land, including those that were grandfathered in. Is that not correct? I, I hope I'm not correct, but I, I think I am. I'm not sure exactly when. I mean, I went back and to verify those, I looked at the conditional use permit approvals in the city council minutes. And no, it was a code change. Isn't mm -hmm. there a code change that says they're all grandfathered, all the grandfathered in, everybody is runs with the land? Is that? I think that was part of the draft proposal, oh. but I don't think that it was put into place because, oh. and like I said, this will be relevant to Planning Commission in about a week and a half for something that they'll okay. be hearing. Oh, that's good. Thank you. I, th I think Alan may have some something to contribute to that. Yeah, I sort of, now that I think about it, I do agree with Julie. We did deliberate on this, and it was in roughly October of 2019. If you look back around that time, see if there are any resolutions, because it did come up in one case, and I know that one case, we let it go. I don't know if that became a policy or not, but it would be right around October 19. Right, that's the draft uh, ordinance that Senior Planner Michelle Anthony prepared, but it was not approved. Good. Tip? So I guess I would say that moving forward, listening to this, 
I would encourage one of the changes to be that uh, we go back that it doesn't follow with the, the land, that it's the, I think there are good reasons for that, the difficulty of controlling. And if 50% of them are not allowed to have it go with the land, I would like to keep it that way. But um, as the people who have the right to have it go with the land decide not to, I can't remember, they have to, um, they have to rent out the property so many days a year or the license, isn't that right? And maintain their business license. And maintain, so they have to maintain their business. Sometimes. It's not trivial. So like they have to maintain the license, they have to rent out so many times. So then the minute that they don't do that and they're not in compliance, then that is their, their license is forfeited. It comes back in the kitty, but then I would have it not follow the land. And I think that there would be healthy turnover because we actually do want turnover. It should be something that's not, you know, like um, the period of history I work at old regime France where you buy an off a political office and it's yours to, and your grandchildren's and your great grandchildren's. That's not like the way you want things to be. You want it to be healthy and move around, right? So if it's not being used, then let people who want to use it, use it. But I wouldn't then um, lessen the number or anything like that, or the 500, I keep what we have. But anyway, to me, this is a good discussion. And maybe the, with those two changes of the owner occupy and then having the, um, the yeah, uh, get rid of the running with the land, that'd be great. That's good, thank you. Good. Additional comments or discussions on this topic? Okay, I guess we can push on to the next thing. Fantastic. That was a great conversation. Um, let's see. Got, got too many things going on over here. So we do want to move into... Yeah. <laughs> um, we, what? Okay. So yes, time? okay. So the question is, are there any other categories that need to be discussed? So, yes. Nancy? Thank you. <laughs> First of all, skip the slide I want to talk to. <laughs> the one um, slide. <laughs> so sorry. The two things. First is I'd like to, uh, you know, thank Judith for bringing up the ADUs because the, HAB, the Housing Advisory Board asked me to bring that up tonight. Um, and they very much want to be here when that is discussed. And it wasn't on your, it's not on the agenda that I've seen. So I would really like to be able to go back and tell them more about that because that's important to a lot of people, both pro and con. My other, and in terms of another category, um, pop-up stores. I don't know if that would go here or not, but I know that there has been interest. Um, going back to the home occupied thing, pop-up stores are often a um, way to, to test out a product or a concept that might become permanent. Um, yes, it is potentially competition with other stores in the area. But anyway, I don't know if there's anything currently in the code for pop-up stores. Uh, and given that we do have empty storefronts on occasion, um, it seems like that would be a, some something in the code that pertains to that would be of great value to us. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And I just wanted to add small scale manufacturing. Small scale manufacturing. I think with technology and things, I think there's potential that you wouldn't need a lot of space to potentially run a business out of management. I'm not quite sure where the code falls in terms of manufacturing in any case. It's an interesting topic. Um, I'd be concerned about the noise. Is that noisy? Well, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying I want it to be discussed. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Do, uh, would you like to have that discussed at a future session and we'd give staff some time to prepare for that or? I mean, I mean, I haven't, I can't say I put a lot of thought into it. I just know that I'm not even quite sure what the definition is exactly, but I think that it could potentially happen out of the art center sometime soon. And I would like to know if that's possible. I'm not saying, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't, anyway, that's my, my comment. It's, you know, it can be 3D printing. It can be, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, I, I'm, you know, basic small tabletop machining. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm just is, saying words. I don't do any of those things. <laughs> it, is making beer manufacturing? It this, could be, right? I don't. Well, I don't know. So. It's a thought. 
Uh, I guess, Christine, I'd look to you for a little advice on this. Is this something maybe we should take up in a future session? What I was just whispering to Jen is that if, if, if you all had some experience in other communities, this would be you know, an interesting topic to discuss, and we could then bring back for more in-depth discussion another point. Yeah, and actually we have dealt with this in other communities. Um, it's, a, it's really about defining what that, what that scale and what the intensity is. Um, but uh, I, I don't have your code up in front of me right now, so I don't remember if, if that's already an allowed use. Um, so I don't know if Mark wants to weigh in on anything that he's done in the past, but um, it's absolutely a use that we look into oftentimes. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, actually, our um, only uh, three Mark, categories for Mark, industrial. Could you, Mark, could you first give us your full name and your in the group you're with, just so we have oh. that for our records, please? <coughs> this, all, this whole thing's being recorded. Yeah, Mark White with White and Smith LLC. We're subs to Logan Timken on this project. Um, we, um, when we create use categories um, in zoning districts, we typically have one in a bigger city. We'll have the the general industrial or the more intensive which is probably not a thing here, um, just land area, if, if nothing else. But we usually have a category, categories for artisanal production where you don't, you know, you, know, you don't have loud machinery, that sort of thing, and, and light industrial. We also typically have um, um, industrial performance standards that address things like dust and noise and those sorts of things. So that can go along with it. Um, and, you know, the disadvantage to that is, you know, what's been pointed out earlier in terms of enforcement, when things get noisy, once you've let that use through the door, then how do you control it? So, you know, that's, that's fair game for discussion because apparently it's been an issue, but um, that's how we typically address those in other zoning codes. Ellen? Now, I, I have a question for Natalie. You brought it up. Were you suggesting, like, in all districts or more like in commercial or? I'm just anticipating that this would come before the planning department sometime in the next couple years. And so it'd be great to have a conversation about it prior to the request. Okay, and I'll just, you know, one observation, we do have manufacturing on Becker's and El Paso Boulevard already. There's a ski furniture manufacturing thing and it can be very loud at times. So maybe we need to look at those regulations. Okay, Christine? So in our commercial district, it is a right. So commercial, what the code reads is that commercial development shall be located and designed so as to minimize conflicts with adjacent residential and historic areas. Mm -hmm. Minimal assembly or manufacturing activities shall be allowed. However, shall be contained inside or behind buildings so as not to be visible from adjacent public right-of-ways or adjacent residential uses. And that's as specific as we are. So, so maybe this is a topic we need to give a little more thought to. Um, we, I guess I would propose that we, we come back at a future session and, and pick this up. It, gives, it would give staff a little chance to um, prepare for it and we could think about it. I mean, it sounds like we're not under any great urgency to, to get to it. Any other comments? Okay, I guess we've covered all the categories, so uh, Jennifer, Great. back to you. Yeah, absolutely. And one way that we can tackle that, that particular use is to, uh, we can bring some recommended language to a future meeting. Um, you will be seeing, um, the, the use categories are actually not gonna be a part of the first module that you see, um, but we could bring kind of some, a little bit more specific use tables to you. Um, at, at a future, a meeting very soon ahead of that kind of module if we wanted to kind of dissect it just a little bit further and just make sure we've got the right uses in the right zone districts, especially with these new zone districts. I think that'll be very important. Um, great. Um, I did want to address one quick thing on the ADUs. Um, there are a lot of communities that um, with the short-term rental in ADU conversation that they do not allow short-term rentals out of their ADUs. I can throw that nugget out there right now, but we can talk a little bit more about ADUs at a, at a future meeting. Uh, so let's move on to definitions. 
And I just wanted to highlight kind of our process and how we're going to tackle the definitions. They're definitely something that we're thinking about as we're going, you know, um, items such as some of the conversation brought up this evening with defining what a temporary use is and some of these things. We're starting to catalog all of these and which, which items need to be defined clearer. Um, we, we will really do a full run through of the definitions at the very end. So we've, like I said, it's kind of an um, iterative process. We're working on the definitions as we go and then they, you know, at the end we just make sure every term has been defined and um, that we're, we're all tight um, with the code. So um, additionally, we, we've, come th we've already combed through the definitions to remove any standards. So any, anything that says, you know, something needs to be so high or so far away, those regulations really need to go within the zone districts and the definition is strictly a definition to keep it clear. Um, we'd like to combine all definitions into one place, which we have already done. We've pulled all the definitions throughout the code and put them in one, one chapter. Uh, we revise and update all definitions. Sometimes you have a definition that may have been in there since the 70s and some of the language isn't clear anymore or it's just not relevant. So we make sure that those are updated and, and current. Um, uh, we drop any definitions, that do, any terms that may be um, old terms that don't need to be defined um, and include any new terms that need to be defined from any of the new language we add. And um, we can add language for uh, standards of measurement. So that can either be in the definition section or kind of part of the definition section. So that's kind of our process that we go through with the definitions. Um, so as, like I said, as we've been talking, we've been taking notes of all the different terms that need to be, that we know of that need to be further defined. Um, and then I thought I'd just open the door to, you know, we've already identified temporary uh, use as, a, as one definition this evening. Some of the others that we hear um, very regularly are habitability or a habitable um, uh, building, you know, what that means, uh, what the definition of family is. That's been changing over the years, so we usually make sure that one is, is current. Um, you know, again, dimensions, defining the different ways to measure things. So signage is a, is a big one and buildings are the other one where you want to make sure it's clearly defined where those measurements are taken from and how they're, how they're um, determined. So are there any others that you all already have thought of throughout this process? Yes. Julie? You might, you might have this already, but um, there was the issue with, I thought when we've had um, discussions around uh, the hotels being used for longer term use, the definition of family, I thought we took that out and, and looked at language um, having to do more with how to define a household, so we might have some of that in there already. Um, I also think in terms of definitions, that while you're going through it, we should look at whether we should be using, you know, proper terminology like they instead of, you know, focusing on he, she, or genders and, you know, all of that kind of normal stuff. I think that's it. Well, uh, Judith? Thank you. Um, I know this is going to come up in a minute, but um, I think it's really important for us to decide what we mean by sustainability. And I know that's a really hard one um, because there's environmental sustainability, there's economic sustainability, but uh, just a general um, thought on that term. Uh, the other two terms that we've been tossing around for quite a while, um, one is affordable housing, and we've been using that interchangeably with attainable housing. Um, and I think we need to um, come to some consensus on, on, on what we mean by those two terms. Um, so in addition to the other ones, the ADUs and the, and the defining temporary versus long term, I think those are my top three. Thank you. Thank you. And I will mention that uh, I believe it's n next week's city council meeting is one of the agenda items. We're going to have a briefing on uh, sustainability from... Um, Conrad, Denise, do you want to add a little more detail on that? Um, just very simple. He's going to be doing about an hour, and he's going to talk about sustainability and the four pillars of sustainability. So we're all talking and, and use the same language as we move forward and as we're looking at this um, from a planning perspective and from a citywide perspective. My understanding is that's not going to be comprehensive or final, but it's just really kind of a place to kick off the discussion. If that's, if I've summarized that uh, appropriately, Denise. 
Okay, any, um, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm feeling like a broken record here, but the Housing Advisory Board has done a very extensive habitability code draft that will be presented to Council on the 17th of August. Um, it includes a lot of definitions. A lot of work has gone into the definitions. And so that's just another place that it would be good to, um, you know, start. <laughs> good, thank you. Tip? Yeah, I, I think these are really great suggestions. <clears throat> I wanted to just um, echo Julie, uh, first of all, about the gender inclusive language. I think that's really in keeping with Manitou's character as well and our commitment to be an inclusive community. I also would be curious to know when the word family is being used, um, as somebody who is gay, that family has been, that word has been used as a weapon and an exclusionary term so often, and it continues to be so. Um, that I would, uh, I don't really understand why in a code there would be something protecting like families here and not other families. Human beings want protections in our community, so I don't really understand. I'd be curious to know when that comes up. And I also, in a, this came up uh, earlier, I know that some of, um, some of you will remember this when we were talking about that sex, the sex business stuff. But um, there was some funny, at that time there were attempts to use terms like we want it so far away from churches. And I was like, well, what about mosques? What about uh, t you know, synagogues? I mean, why do we have this kind of Christian um, focus? Um, and uh, I hope that in the rewriting the code, we would be ecumenical and not be privileging one type of religious attitude over others. And um, at, when we had that discussion, this I think is a little bit more complex, complex because of um, kind of how norms get established historically. But I also even wonder about the exceptions for Sundays, which are based on a Christian principle when other religious traditions have other days. Personally, that makes me un uncomfortable. Um, I, I know that reasonable people disagree about this, but to me, I would rather not have those kinds of exceptions. I would ha treat every day the same. Or any other aspect of the code that is Im embedded or um, you know anchored in um, I, it's not that I'm anti-Christian. My background is Christian. I hope, you know, it's not that. It's just I don't think that that's appropriate to privilege one religion over another in a, in a code in any way. Thank you. Additional comments? Okay, I guess we've spoken to this topic. Great, thank you. And actually, to both of your point, uh, uh, most codes are moving towards household. Um, it, it's... It's trying to be more inclusive, trying to, we, we've been combing through all of our codes for taking the he, she's out and, and changing to they. So uh, that's definitely part of our process. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, all right, if we have enough energy in us to get through sustainability, <laughs> uh, we can run through that one. Are we good, everybody? All right, <laughs> this, is, this is one of my favorite topics. I don't know why, it's just, it's fun. I think it can be integrated in all parts of the code. So. Um, so um, why, dis why discuss green infrastructure? The question is, um, you know, the sustainability was one of the main tenets of, of Plan Manitou Comprehensive Plan. So um, our code efforts are always um, in huge part to implement the comprehensive plan. Uh, many residents want to see increased efforts to increase or integrate green infrastructure. And um, we've heard a lot from uh, our stakeholder engagement and public engagement and with different um, interest groups um, and different, um, yeah, the uh, commissions um, and committees that we need better tree protections or tree um, preservations and landscape um, requirements. And really the, the Manitou Springs Code currently is very minimal in the landscape category, landscape regulation. So um, that's one, one area that we can really uh, um, address green infrastructure. Um, so uh, looking a little further, a little broader, many communities in the Western United States are including low impact development regulations. Uh, Phoenix is kind of at the forefront with their LID handbook for alternative stormwater management and they've gone as far as they developed a manual, um, a, a handbook, and then they've done studies to see which um, 
which methods are actually working in the West. Um, and it, it's been really helpful for those of us, you know, in the West to understand, you know, we're not Portland. We don't have the porous soils to really um, infiltrate as well as, um, as, the, as, you know, the East and West Coast. So we're, we have very clay soils. It makes it a little more difficult to get water to percolate easily. Um, Fort Collins, Colorado, um, they, every time I turn around, they're adding something to their code. <laughs> Um, I live in Fort Collins, so I'm very well aware of their code and, and, and live and breathe it, but um, they have really, really well-established tree preservation requirements, and they're not too stringent, so they, they really strike a balance between uh, preserving, you know, your larger trees and mitigating them, um, and they also have some LID standards, again, which really have struck a balance, uh, whereas the development community is still feels, you know, like they're not being having barriers in place. Um, and they're still able to really develop within the town, um, but they've definitely set the standard that sustainability is important. Uh, Longmont has a chapter dedicated to trees and plants. I, I don't know if we need to go quite that far, but it's um, they have a very extensive tree mitigation and protection plan. Um, Golden and Lakewood are um, have sustainability menus, which we can talk about a little bit right here at the end, but. Um, and Mark actually has been implementing a sustainability menu in Westminster, um, and so, and, and I think has done in a couple of other communities as well. So that's becoming a very, um, a very, uh, I don't want to say new, but a, a, a nice way to integrate sustainability with other practices. And then Yavapai County, Arizona, um, they went as far as uh, providing density incentives for conservation features. So um, just kind of giving you the gamut of what, what other communities are doing. Um, we've talked a lot throughout this process about embracing the creek. Um, I think I, I think it kind of goes without saying that, that everyone is, or in general, we are in agreement that um, you know embracing the creek, especially in the areas of the URA or the East End or maybe even the West End and undeveloped properties, and encouraging that um, uh, you know the the dual sided uh, buildings. So you may have an entrance off of the street but you may also have kind of a secondary entrance off of the creek. Maybe it's public space, maybe it's um, outdoor dining, but it's, it's not closing the, your, your um, you know, turning your back to the creek where that's where your service area is and your parking, but really embracing the creek. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of communities around here that have been doing this lately. Uh, the Pueblo Riverwalk is one uh, that's very well known. Um, Salida downtown that's been in place for a while where they've embraced the creek and have the, the river walk right along. Um, the Arkansas, uh, Colorado Springs has a complete creeks program and I've been doing a little research on that, you know, trying to um, embrace the creeks again and, and, and allow um, use of the, the creeks and, and rivers. Um, the Una Vista river walk is um, kind of new and under development um, coming along. And uh, then uh, Mark has talked about the Frederick Historic District before, where they've completely embraced the creek in their in their zoning. Um, so that's one one concept that we're proposing to integrate within the code. Um, low impact design does not need to be extensive. It can be as simple as um, limiting pervious area, um, you know, requiring a certain amount, a uh, certain percentage of a site to be impervious, whether that be landscaped or pervious pavement. Um, we could require LID measures such as bioswales and rain, rain gardens, or offer that as a you know an option to to um, increase the pervious surfaces, uh, promote water conservation measures, and then provide a water wise plant list. So, plant lists are a great way to work with the code to um, to just provide suggestions and alternatives. Um, oftentimes, uh, oh another another really good. Um, tool is to require landscape architects to provide the landscape plan that gets reviewed by, by you all. Um, but providing that water-wise plant list really helps um, narrow down the, the appropriate species to be used um, in a community. Um, the city of Aurora has gone so far as to have a three-tiered system. So they have your um, kind of general adaptive species, then they have your really low water species, and then they have no water species. So it just gives designers or um, business owners a little bit more um, information on how they can better uh, regulate their landscapes and, and use water wisely. Um, 
the urban tree canopy, uh, it's been proven across the country that you know, the trees cool our surfaces. So anywhere that we can um, encourage uh, trees in parking lots, trees, uh, street trees, um, trees in areas that are, you know, protecting our, um, our paved surfaces to cool them is helpful. So the two areas that we had talked about was developing more stringent um, preservation standards. So um, we, can, we can go anywhere from, a lot of communities have anything, a tree that is, 10 or 12 inch caliper or larger, which you know that's that's your circumference of the tree. So that's still a pretty large tree, but if, if that particular size tree was um, in the way of a development, then it was going to come down or be proposed for removal, then it would be need to be mitigated with X number of trees to replace that tree canopy. Um, the other option is to um, add regulations for parking lots, like we said, and that's that can be a kind of a sliding scale. It depends on the number of parking spaces. So if you're talking two or three parking spaces, there may not be a tree requirement. If you're 10 spaces, we may say, you know, there's a requirement for trees on the end caps. Um, renewable energy infrastructure is another way to, um, to uh, promote sustainable and green infrastructure, um, requiring all commercial and in residential garages to include the infrastructure for electric charging stations to be looking into the future. Um, that doesn't mean you have to in include the actual charging stations, but include the conduit and the um, electric um, capacity to allow for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, you can require all new residential buildings to include conduit and infrastructure for solar as well. Both of those are a very low cost addition to a building, but just thinking, thinking to the future and allowing that option. Um, and then developing solar access requirements. I know there's not a, a lot of land left to be developed in Manitou Springs, but being conscientious of um, not blocking the next door neighbor's solar access, um, being able to, City of Fort Collins actually has a requirement that 10% of a, a, a full residential neighborhood needs to have uh, rooftops facing south or west to take advantage of um, solar access. So there's, there's things like that that we can do as well. Um, dark sky lighting is, is the last one, and I believe there's an ordinance that has already been um, started on dark sky lighting, maybe a little bit, so we can build off of that. It's really pretty straightforward. Um, it's about re requiring a certain limit on lighting um, output, um, full cutoff lighting, which most communities already have in place, and requiring a certain color, um, that more of the amber color, which I have found kind of has a bit of a conflict with LED lighting, which is also a sustainable measure. So um, I think it's finding a balance with that. Um, I will say one little story. I've, um, in the city of Fort Collins, they've been replacing a lot of their street lights with LED. They are technically full cutoff, but those LEDs are so bright that they just, you know, in my neighborhood, they have one. And we went from a nice soft neighborhood light to this blinding light in my neighbor's yard. And I don't, they haven't complained yet, but um, it, it's an interesting concept to think about. So um, then the sustainability menus get a little more complicated, but um, to simplify them, it's to say that um, we can have certain standards that might be just infused without, within the whole code to um, encourage green infrastructure. Um, but maybe there is additional um, standards that you're not comfortable putting in place as a, as a hard and fast standard, but you might want to test it. Um, or you might want to provide the opportunity for it and give some sort of incentive to do certain, um, certain things. Um, and that can be anywhere from you know, additional green infrastructure, true rain gardens and bioswales. Um, I've seen even in these menus, you know, transportation components or um, you know, providing a certain number of covered bike parking spaces and showers in your in your building for people who are biking to work rather than driving to work could maybe give um, you know an incentive to reduce parking requirements or something to that effect so the sustainability menus start to build into a point system typically where you would have um, a certain number of points given for for different types of um, sustainable elements integrated into your project and then based on that point system you can build in an incentive program that would provide a reduction in something or an additional density or different things of those nature. So, um, so that's my spiel on all of that. And I just wanted to see, are there any other questions 
or options that we should um, consider for inclusion in the code within this, this category? Um, do you have examples of regulations or incentives from other communities that you really liked that you think we need to be looking at? Um, and just any, any general thoughts and comments on the direction? Is this, the, are the, some of the recommendations we gave um, suitable and, and amenable, or you know, which direction do we want to take? Kaminsky. Um, start with, go, we'll start with Judith this time. Oh boy, are you sure, are you, sure you want to do that? <laughs> first, first of all, um, for th for those of you who know me, um, I'm a certainly a sustainability is my my passion, my life's work. Um, I'm also a news junkie, and yesterday I read an article, the title of which was "Climate Change is Here." Exclamation point! As though it just arrived yesterday. So for someone who's been passionately working on it since the 1980s, it's it's frustrating. But I'm so grateful, not only that we're having this conversation now, um, because this is dire, um, but also to thank you, Ms. Gardner, for taking the time to come um, and spend hours with the Climate Action Work Group and talk about this. So I'm gonna try to be brief, but um, I think that, <laughs> Um, nothing frustrates me more than a heritage tree being cut down that doesn't have to be cut down. Um, and we talked about a number, uh, I looked at a number of communities, Fort Collins, but also Sarasota, I think we talked about that, um, that um, have a tree permitting program. And um, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, anything over a six inch caliper tree, you must have a permit that costs $25 to take that tree out. You must have a reason to take that tree out, which is, you know, sometimes trees need to come out. <laughs> um, and you have to replace that tree within 12 months with a, another tree or another acceptable landscape plan within 12 months, and then that's monitored. So I really think it's time for us to actually get down in the dirt and write that in the code um, that we are so protective of our trees. Every time a tree comes down that is six inches or greater, two tons of carbon are released to the atmosphere. So just in the trees that came down on Becker's Lane, I'm not even talking about the ones by the condos or the 76 heritage trees that came down on El, 6 El Paso. Um, so think about the carbon that was released, reduced, uh, released to the environment. Um, so um, the other thing I'd like to see with uh, all, all development, um, residential and commercial, is that if you provide a landscape plan to um, planning and it's accepted, that you stick to that landscape plan and you have someone come out and make sure that you are um, staying true to that landscape plan. Um, so we have to worry about um, um, heat domes. They're coming, I think we're having one soon, but we've seen them in, across the United States. The way we can prevent heat domes is to increase our canopy. We decrease, um, um, Heat, the heat island effect, so we have to really be, be careful. I would like to see a tree planted for every three to four parking spaces because parking lots are the worst offenders, right? We have black, um, uh, uh, we have uh, asphalt being put down. Um, so the things that can mitigate that are um, planting trees, um, uh, putting your parking uh, spaces in our, in our situation, in our town, um, in ways that um, you use trees and bioswells. Uh, Hiawatha Gardens is a perfect, exa perfect example. Um, you have your parking that actually encourages um, runoff from a flood, right? Because you've got this, this um, north-south parking. You always put your parking against your, your storm water, your, your runoff, and you put bioswales and you put trees. So there's so many things to do. And also, communities are starting to paint. And this is something for our art district. Um, the more reflective paint you put on a parking lot in the form of art reflects white and light colors reflect the heat. So there's there's just, there's so many things we can do here. I um, don't wanna take up so much time, but I, I think this is um, a time where Manitou can really shine as a community. Um, we are a health and wellness destination and we can be the community that shows everyone else um, how to do it. Um, there was a, and, uh, KRCC had a, uh, a um, Ithaca, New York, um, the youngest mayor ever elected, and um, he's being lauded as the climate change 
uh, guru, and he is determined to make his town uh, carbon neutral by 2040. Um, and we need to be also thinking about electric cars. When we lease a car or buy a car in the city, it should be an electric vehicle. We should not be buying um, anything other than a hybrid car. So again, I, you know, I could go on forever, but with regards to just sustainability, um, there are so many things we can do that really are not that um, crazy. But if, if, if I come away with anything tonight, I would really hope that this group would consider a tree permitting program. The, the funds of the tree permit would go into a fund to, to, to um, either Parks and Rec or a sustainability fund where we could work on other sustainability efforts. And I won't even go into the buildings and so on, but there's just so much we can do. And I, 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 I'm so willing to work with you to, to, to talk about that further. Thank you. Good, thank you. I see hand raised down here. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, I, I can't really follow that, but <laughs> um, I, because I'm coming with all, not all those great examples, um, because I'm hoping that you'll go find the examples. Um, but I was happy to see a couple things in terms of bike infrastructure um, and electric vehicle charging stations and so on. So I, I just want to reiterate the point again that anything we can do in terms of complete streets um, uh, is, is, in my thought, very, very important for this community. And anything that we can do to incorporate, and I have no idea how to do it, <laughs> um, but incorporate more public transportation in, in terms of you know, our land use and so on, I think that that's very critical as well. Thank you. Other comments? Tip. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm so professorial. I can't shut up all the time. And I get stimulated by what you guys are saying. Um, and so uh, <laughs> what a, just a very quick thing. I think these suggestions are excellent. Um, the w one thing that crossed my mind when you were talking about the solar energy and trying to have it in, you know, make it so that there, it could be in houses, I think that's great. Um, one of the things, uh, I, th I think it'd be great to add um, investment in solar farms for energy offsets. Um, Manitou had a program, I don't remember when it was, maybe 12 years ago, um, and offered a special deal to um, for people who work uh, for the city or on, were on any of the Mission. So since I was on planning, um, Dennis and I bought into, at a discounted rate, a 20-year program for solar farms somewhere else. And then we get an offset with the, off of our energy bill. And honestly, I don't know why we aren't trying to work that out for all residents in Manitou. I think that would make go a huge way to, toward reducing our carbon footprint. But um, be that as it may, I think just to try to accentuate for new development to, if you have a, um, you know, you have a list to um, encourage buying into solar farms. It doesn't have to be here on the actual building. It just has to be somewhere. Good, thank you. Anybody else? So we, so we have a tie here. David, how about you go next? Well, I find this very encouraging. Um, obviously, when we talk about zoning, we want to prevent some negative things from happening. But uh, I was going to make a, a request, not just to you, Jennifer, but uh, really to all of us, that we focus also on the ways in which the zoning code can encourage positive things. Uh, Manitou is a, a really a wonderful place. I think we all agree on that. And part of it is because we're creative. And um, we don't want the zoning code only to tamp down and avoid uh, negative impacts and problems. And this, these are great examples, Judith, of Nancy, of how to uh, use the zoning code to encourage some positive <laughs> results. That's, I find that very encouraging. So I don't have to make my request, I guess. OK. Judith, just, just a second. Judith, I was going to see if there's someone else who hasn't spoken yet that wanted to talk. Okay, go ahead, Judith. Um, so just briefly, um, uh, two things that you have on the low-impact low design slide. Um, limiting pervious area, areas. Um, so concrete is a big problem for us, and so I want us to actually consider specifically with the 
a creek walk design to put as many impervious areas as we can. Uh, it does not always all have to be concrete. Um, and other, other ways to do, uh, uh, in fact, Fort Collins is using a lot of impervious design uh, footprints on their parking lots. Um, with regard to the water-wise plant list, um, just wanted to say that um, we have um, Pikes Peak Permaculture here, we have the Tree Planting Group, group Climate Action, and we have the Pollinator Group here in town. And we have a list not only of water-wise plants, but of pollinator native habitat species of plants that are um, that that are native to this habitat so we already have that so I think it, it that I, I'm a really a fan of that and I'm, I'm also really a fan of the menu list I just really think that's a great idea to give give um, both residential and commercial developers in the city a, a menu to choose from and, and and score points I don't know what the points get you but I, I like that idea of a menu that so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that thank you thank you uh, just one thing, I'd like us to clarify the terms pervious and impervious. I think we're switching them. Pervious is what we want. Impervious is what we have too much of. Great, thank you. Good. Um, so I guess, uh, any, any further comments here? I can just about to sum things up. Um, so I guess Christine, Jennifer, have we given you sufficient direction tonight? Is that if there's any ambiguity uh, or you need clarification, it's be a good time to ask. I feel like this was a very productive work session and I have a lot of great direction. Um, our, our next step is actually to, um, we've been working on the design guidelines based on our last conversation and the last piece we needed to make that all come together was this zoning conversation we had this evening and the kind of the use categories. So we'll start to um, <clears throat> piece all of that together um, I believe we have one more work session with you um, on parking. That's right, parking, and we can bring back a couple of these um, additional use categories that we talked about this evening, and I believe that would be a good time to bring up ADUs. Are there any other topics? That, that was kind of the last topic we had proposed to bring to you all. Are there any other topics um, that you would like us to bring to you at that, um, at that meeting? I was under the impression it's that we had quite a number of things to that would take us up through uh, basically to November. So, Is that yeah, so then the next meeting after that, so that would be, what are we in, July? So that would be August, late August, and then your September meeting, we would be bringing back the, mo the actual written module, draft module of the design guidelines and zoning to um, make sure we got everything in there that we, we wanted to. I think that one really um, bears a little more scrutiny to make sure that those character areas were defined appropriately. And then from then on, you'll start to see actual code language that we will workshop through the rest of the year. Okay, good. Well, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask uh, the, the planning commissioners and city council members, uh, it seems to me like we're reasonably happy with the way we're doing business here. Is this process agreeable to you? Uh, I hope so. I'm, if not, okay, Alan? It, yeah, I'd say, um, being a victim of probably a dozen or half dozen joint council commission work sessions over the years, this has been one of the best. Okay, so you, you think we're, I, I think we're adding value in, in making progress. I, Julie, please. I do think it's really helpful. I would just um, emphasize that once you start writing the code, it's gonna be a lot for us to read. And so it would really be helpful if we could get it way in advance of the meeting so that we have, you know, a couple, it depends if you're going to give us the whole code read write in one day or if it's going to be, you know, in sections. But I just want to be sure that the public has an opportunity to know about it and that we have sufficient time to review and read. I don't want to get one of these things on a Friday that we're supposed to be prepared by Tuesday. No. And I also hope that the public has an opportunity somehow to, um, see what's being proposed and that our website allows people to know that um, they're encouraged, unlike most work sessions, to come and say their um, opinion um, here because um, that was a big deal that the Planning Commission made, I think I told you, John, uh, right. that they really wanted the public to come and we had nobody come because nobody knows that after a year and a half, guess what, there's a new rule. You can talk during work sessions <laughs> if you're the public, if it's about the code rewrite. So um, I just think it's really helpful, and I hope we have sufficient time to read everything before we have our meetings about it. 
Yeah, and that, that's a good point, Julie. I mean, and certainly trying to figure out how to let the get get the public interaction and to get it early on so that we're hearing things in July and August rather than you know the night before Thanksgiving and we're trying to wrap the thing up by the end of the year. No, that that's important. We we are trying to figure out the mechanism, but really I think we have made progress. We've got you know. You know, we've got a, a one board of seven, another board of seven, and then we have have staff and, and our consultants. So that's a pretty good sized group, and I think we had good discussion and we stayed on topic and on point. And I think now I, I'm feeling a little more comfortable that we can bring in uh, additional uh, dialogue and, and make progress. So I think your point's well taken. Nancy? Thank you. Um, two comments. One is just a request that everyone will be tired of hearing, is tired of hearing from me. But rather than talking about parking, could we at least use the term mobility instead? Um, I, think, I think words are very, very important. And when we only refer to it as parking, it really limits what we think about. Um, secondly, Christine, I was hoping you could address the, is it a strategic working group or something? There's another. And I mean, you sent an email today showing that I think you're on your second meeting or you're about to have your second meeting. Could you just talk a little bit about who's on that, what, what you're doing, what the value added is to them, et cetera? Thank you. You bet. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to address that during our closing if it didn't come up sooner. So we have a community advisory group, um, just for everyone's reminder of how that came about is it it broad as broadly invitational as we could have made it. So um, what that means is anyone who is interested in participating can reach out at any time, at any point during the process. Right now we have, I believe, um, maybe a dozen and a half individuals who have specifically requested, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically requested that they be kept in the loop so that they can be invited to these meetings. In August, we have two meetings that will be scheduled. As you can see, we're really um, picking up speed in terms of content and what we're looking at. It's important that their time is useful and meaningful. So we didn't want to schedule, we don't want to schedule meetings for the sake of meetings, right? We want to have substantive input and processes for them. So in August, um, we sent out doodle polls for folks to participate. Meeting number two will be via Zoom. At this moment, meeting number three is scheduled to be in person. It's scheduled for the day after your next joint session. That could change depending on what the group is interested in or local health issues depending on what's happening. We're hoping for it to be an in-person session because we think that'll be a lengthy conversation. And I think that's, did I address your questions? Yeah, so you've had one meeting already. What What is coming out? What are the objectives? I mean, I did see the agenda, but what are the objectives? What is coming out of the meeting? What What are the expectations of this group? Fair question. So the expectation is that they'll do a deep dive into the subjects much as you are. Their perspective is different depending on where they're coming from. It may be from simply as a resident. They are not members of planning commission, not all of them, some planning commissioners and city council are invited, but they're coming at a detailed conversation, a facilitated conversation, much as what we're having here. So it'll be broadening the opportunity for a facilitated conversation. Okay, and I, I think all of that is very, very helpful. Are, but I'm wondering, are there like, um, did you go out seeking specific skill sets like an architect, developer, a, you know, code person, that sort of thing, or is it just a, hodgepodge of folks. It, not that that's bad, hodgepodges are good, but I'm just curious about the make, you know, the actual makeup. If you've got 18, about 18 people currently, and are they always gonna be coming, or is it is it a true commitment, or is it just when they can show up they might or not? I'm Yeah, I'm just curious about this group. Sure, so from a skill set, both. Um, technical specialties and hodgepodginess, if you will. <laughs> So um, there were, we, we did scout out in the community and specifically invite folks who were architects or planners, landscape architects. Um, I believe there's an individual who is an attorney who is interested. Um, some folks have a very specific interest. They may only be interested in ADUs, for example. And because we were not discussing, for example, ADUs, 
at the first meeting, they were not interested in coming. Um, it is not a mandated participation. Um, the way that we're structuring these is that folks can come into a conversation and completely participate. And if they don't come to the next one, that's okay also. Um, our expectation is that as we roll out the modules, that group will also have the opportunity. They will be looking at the modules. They'll be looking at language. They'll be discussing definitions and have as much of um, a, an opportunity to participate and have this type of dialogue as you all are. You're Christine, welcome. can you send a list to this group of who's participating in that group so that they know who's on that? I can email out the distribution list. Those may not all be folks who are participating, but have asked to be kept in the loop when meetings are happening and what the agenda items are so that they could participate, but absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, um, I think we pretty well covered this topic. Uh, council does have a couple things still to cover, our typical council correspondence and reports from the administrators. Um, so I'd like to sum up here and just pretty quickly. So, Jennifer, did you have something? Yeah, I just had one question. Um, we were thinking of sending the modules um, to, to Council Member um, Wolf's point. Um, we are planning to send out the code in, in small chunks so they're more digestible so we can focus on specific topics so it won't be all the whole code at once. Um, and we were planning on two weeks ahead. Is that enough or do we need to stretch that a little? I'm trying to give us sufficient time to get the right amount of detail in there for you to review. So are there any thoughts on on timing. Julie? How, how is that going to be disseminated to the public? And because then would, if you're going to have it in the newspaper, you need to coordinate it with the deadline for publishing. If you're going to put it on the website, that I, I don't, that, so the timing, the answer to your question, at least in my mind, depends in part on the answer to my question. In terms of us, uh, Firstly, I think having two weeks to read is, is plenty and is great, but I just want to see that the public has an opportunity to see this. Yeah, they will. We'll post each module on the website for them to review. So. Okay, great. Jennifer, do you have anything else? No, other than just thank you guys so much for all of your input. It's very, very helpful. So. Great. Thank you very much. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, We'll go ahead and wrap things up in a little bit. Uh, anyone who would like to leave now is uh, welcome to do so. Thank you for coming. We do appreciate the, uh, the support from the Planning Commission and from staff and our consultants. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and move on to council correspondence. Does anybody have anything? Julie, Judith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so OSAC met last night. It was quite a long agenda. And I uh, really, the take home is the idle property is going, is, it's a done deal. And so that uh, adds a tremendous amount of open space to our, to our portfolio. So thrilled about that. And I asked um, Chair Nancy Wilson if she had anything else she wanted me to bring forward tonight. And she just said, um, please encourage people to join OSAC. Um, they are down two regular members and one alternate, so really looking for some new people. Um, and the only other comment I want to make is I got a phone call from a resident who um, she and her husband have been long-term residents here, and they are also business owners. And she just wanted to thank council, especially the council members who have been um, very uh, vocal about um, the parking and traffic issues, especially as they relate to the incline and the cog at this time. And she just wanted to, to send that thanks um, that I'll spread out to you. Um, specifically mentioned um, Councillor Bremner, Councillor Wolf, and Councillor Shada. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, just a reminder that next Monday, the 2nd at 6.30 here in Memorial Hall is a um, election workshop. And I'm hoping, in fact, if folks could let me know if you're able to attend, I would, hoping that you all could speak about the challenges, rewards of being on council, um, just a couple minutes. So, Joe Hands, who might, so we'll have some representation, great. 
Um, yeah, and it will also include stuff on boards and commissions. Um, same thing. So thank you. What, what time was that, Nancy? 6.30. 6.30, okay. Steve? Yeah, I, I just had a, a comment. It's regarding the, the restrooms, and it's in general. I think, I don't know why they're locked at night. For instance, the Bar Trail parking lot is locked at night. Um, I'm not sure about the one at Soda Springs Park. I, I understand that maybe homeless people might go in there and sleep at night. I'm not even against that. But I do know that at the Bar Trail parking lot, I had a complaint from a good friend of mine um, that at 4 o'clock in the morning when she's inclined to go up there and, and go hiking, there's people that are there as well, and the bathroom's locked, and they're just going in the bushes, which is not very sanitary. And not, so I just like to see the bathrooms open all the time. Okay, and Steve, I think Denise has uh, some background information on that. Yeah, this is something we're looking at. I will tell you, last year we did have them open and there was some vandalism and there was also illegal encampments which caused some safety issues at 4 o'clock in the morning. So there, what seems like an easy answer is not always an easy answer and we have found some drug paraphernalia and other things that cause other safety issues. So that's why we've been locking them. We are looking at what other options we have right now I don't have an answer today, but we are looking at it and discussing it internally. But there are some safety concerns that come with this. And then the other thing is, when is the trail open? We want to make sure we're not opening a, a, a restroom whenever it's really closed and encouraging illegal behavior. So we're really we're looking at this from a holistic perspective. Okay, my understanding is also the one of the one of the things we're looking at is the possibility of putting a porta potty in there until maybe the first of October. But, I mean, this is really 14 or season, so I can see where a lot of people would want to be on the trail at 4 in the morning. And, and it, uh, you know, it tis the, tis the season. Anybody else? Okay, if not, let's go on to uh, city administrators. Roy was on vacation, so he doesn't have anything. I guess it's only me. <laughs> um, I just have a few things. Is... Um, we, the coffee with the cop was this morning. It was very successful, very well turned out. So, and um, Thursday, I believe, is Becker's uh, over in that area with the cop, which is great. Um, Thursday morning is coffee with the city administrator. So I'll be here in this room and um, open for anybody who would like to come in and talk with me about any concerns or issues they have. And then tomorrow is our um, employee picnic. So we will be closed for about three hours and enjoying each other's company. And it's the first time that we've had an employee picnic, I think, for four to five years. So the employees are excited about that. So that's tomorrow. I also want to let you know we are working on a water tour. And I'm sorry, that's not I, I can't pronounce that word exactly. But we are working on a water tour for all of city council. And um, I will be getting you the date. We'll be doing a Friday. And we'll go look at all the facilities, and then we'll be going up to the reservoir and providing lunch. So we'll, I'll be keeping you posted on that to really understand the water system and see the water treatment plant and everything that we've done there. And uh, I was up there on Monday, and Kirk is um, a wealth of information, and it's really fun to see. So we'll be working on that also. I do want to let you know that we have been, we met with Nancy Wilson and her son-in-law this last week about electric charging stations, especially rapid electric charging stations. So we're working on it internally and then we'll be bringing that to council. I don't have the date, I don't have when that will be, but we are managing that and we'll be bringing it to council. At some, There are some grants out there as we continue to look at it. So. That I just wanted to share no details yet, but we'll be bringing it in the near future. Okay, great, thanks. Well, if there's nothing else, I, oh, Julie? Sure, yeah, no, it's okay. It's out of line, but um, are we gonna get an update anytime soon on the, um, the Hiawatha building and the results of the demo? Yeah, the that, I'm sorry, that, that is scheduled for the work session on uh, August the 10th, August. so there'll be oh, that okay. update. And I think that night we also have uh, the update on the library as well. Oh, thank you.
Can okay. I make two more comments oh, oh. real quick? I'm sorry, I forgot oh. about two things. Okay. Um, Councilor Shada, you sent us some great information today, so thank you for that. We are looking into it. I've sent that to Alex and asked him to really evaluate and come back, so it may be a week or so before we do that. Um, and Councilor Wolf, you asked for some information that we said we'd get to you today, and I apologize we did not, so we'll be getting that to you in the next couple of days. Great, and what's that? Um, yeah, Judith, okay, and then. I, I just think, I wanna throw this out. Um, I think we need to talk about COVID. Um, things are changing. Um, El Paso County, um, if you go to one re website, it says we're orange. If you go to the El Paso County um, Health Department, we're in red. I believe it's either seven or eight new cases in Manitou in the last seven days. Um, we, the CDC is um, recommending masks inside at this time and I just you know it's it's uh, hard to be have to bring up this topic but I think we need to have that conversation so um, it's, it's out there and I think we need to think about uh, keeping everyone safe here and um, how we go about that um, in the near future okay we could put that on the agenda for next week if that's does that sound reasonable and it'll, obviously it'll depend on facts that are going to be changing pretty quickly, but I think we could block out some time for that. You bet. I'll have Megan, who's our COVID um, facilitator and liaison, look at this, and we'll come back with recommendations of operations like I did last time. It may be that we start making or asking all employees to wear them and internal and those things. So let me look into it. That's a great reminder. Thank you, and we'll, we'll move on that. Okay. If, if I could just ask to legal implications of requiring immunizations of folks. I that's why I want to know the legal implications. A lot of places are doing it, so I, I don't know. That's why I'm that's why I'm asking the question. Nancy, I do think there I can send you an article. I think uh, the attorney general has ruled that it is okay to mandate them. I can send you that article. I think I saw it two days ago. What? No, the federal, at the federal level. I said that it is absolutely okay for an employer to require vaccination. I'll follow up with Jeff and make sure I get the legal, but we'll work on that too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, and since this is a work session, we don't really need to vote on uh, an adjournment, so let's call it a night. Adjourn. Thanks, all. It was, I think it was a productive night. You, you worked well and you worked hard and you had good thoughts.